Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's joint GLI GDI workshop Novel Treatment Regiment and DST Methods. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Your microphone has been muted to avoid background noise. We encourage you to turn your webcam on throughout the session if you are able to. Can we also please ask you to change your display name to your name and country? In today's session, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions and comments to today's presenters by typing your questions into the chat. You can send questions via the chat at any time during the session. The moderators will collect them and address them after the speaker's presentation or in the allocated Q&A sections. You will have the opportunity to intervene also by submitting a request to do so via the chat or by using the hand raise uh, Zoom function. The moderators will record your request and inform you if and when you can intervene. They will have the opportunity to provide feedback in the end of the session evaluation survey which will appear directly in your browser right after the session closes. Please complete the survey right after the session closes as the link will only be available for a short period of time. You will receive a certificate based on your attendance and the completion of this survey. Also, the event is being accredited by the European Board of Accreditation of Pneumology and uh, you will be able then to claim CME points for your attendance. Information on how to claim your CME credit will be shared after the workshop by email. Please note that this session is being recorded and the recording will be available to the public a few days after the session and it will also be sent to you uh, by email a couple days after the session. Finally, it's my pleasure to inform you that today's chair are Dr. Margaret Massinga and Dr. Sarabjit Shada. Over to you, Dr. Shada. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome to this joint GLI GDI workshop on non novel treatment regimens and DST methods. Uh, before I begin, I have the pleasure of introducing my co-chair uh, to all of you, Dr. Margaret Masinga. Uh, Dr. Margaret uh, is a senior lab advisor with ASLM, overseeing lab networks and system strengthening. She's a member of the Stop TB Partnership Global Lab Initiative Code Group and also a chair uh, of the same and is also a regional GLC laboratory consultant for programmatic management of drug resistant TB. She comes with over 18 years of experience working at the interface of clinical research and national lab systems, reinforcement for better infectious disease control. She aims at fostering better linkages between researchers, policymakers, and national health authorities to ensure better uptake of new recommendations, technologies, and scale up of new diagnostic tools. Uh, over to you, Margaret. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sarajit. So I will in turn introduce Dr. Sarajit Shada, who is a clinician by training with over 15 years of experience treating TB, including drug-resistant TB and public health. Um, earlier, he worked with the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, otherwise known as the Union, as Deputy Regional uh, Director, heading the TB and Communicable Disease Units for Southeast Asia. He is currently working with the Foundation for Innovative uh, New Diagnostics Find as the Regional Technical Director for India and Southeast Asia. In addition, uh, Dr. Sarajit serves as the Chair of the Global Drug Resistant uh, TB Initiative, GDI, and is also a core group member of the Global Laboratory Initiative, GLI. So back to you, uh, Dr. Sarajit, thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, so we will start with the sessions now, but before that, I would like to give you a little background uh, on today's course. As you're all aware, you know that detection, treatment, and care of individuals with TB, especially in high burden countries with limited resources, uh, is a big challenge. And very recently, you know, because of the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, 
more complexities have been added. And you're all aware that, you know, because of COVID-19, there has been a significant impact on the diagnosis of TB and notification as well. So the Global Lab Initiative, GLI, and the Global Drug Resistant TB Initiative, GDI, which are working towards strengthening laboratory and clinical management capacity for programmatic management of TB and drug resistant TB, have organized this course, which focuses on novel treatments uh, and DST methods. We have a great lineup of speakers today who will describe or go through you know, the various novel treatment regimens, the country experiences, what are the challenges faced, and how these novel regimens have performed. So without uh, wasting much time, I will go to our first speaker. Uh, and this will and, and over to uh, Dr. Margaret to, to introduce uh, the first speaker for this session. Thank you. So our first speaker today will be uh, Ignacio Monedero. Uh, who is a medical doctor with more than 21 years of uh, clinical practice uh, and working for the last 17 years in programmatic and clinical TB management. Um, Dr. Monedero has been working uh, in more than 30 countries. Um, after uh, working for two years in sub-Saharan Africa in TB and HIV in tough condition, uh, he completed a Master of Public Health in developing countries. Um, in 2008, uh, Dr. Monedero joined the union as a TB HIV and drug resistant TB consultant and has delivered since then more than 45 clinical trainings and more than 35 clinical technical assistance mission, um, mainly on drug resistant TB for WHO. Uh, Dr. Monedero is the author of more than 30 peer reviewed publications and a collaborator of uh, the union and uh, WHO guidelines. Currently, he continues working as an international TB consultant for WHO and the Union, jointly with different academic and clinical managerial positions in Spain, uh, including the COVID-19 uh, outbreak team leader from 2020 to 2021. Dr. Modedero is currently uh, the GDI's vice chair, uh, a member of Emerald RGLC, and part-time uh, providing second medical opinions uh, for infectious diseases. So, uh, Dr. Monedero, the floor is yours. Over. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, if you allow me, I'm going to share my screen because the, the topic is really, really wide and, and the time is very short. Can you see the screen? Yes, it can. yes we can. Uh, maybe to put it in presenter's mode. Thank mm. you. Presentation. Okay. Okay. I think it's going. Is is it working properly? Can we continue? Yes, it is now fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, just to let you know, I, I came to to this presentation really in a humble way because I'm I'm mainly a drug resistant TB physician, right? So I've been not much involved in in the management or, or working in in complex emergencies during my life. The point is that uh, when I was joining the, the AMRO RGLC, I was just forced um, to work uh, in countries with, with very complex emergencies. Uh, so what we are going to tell you here during the next minutes, it's about my experience and other people's experience uh, working with drug resistant TB in very complex emergencies and really tough conditions. But by the way, that there are not too much evidence uh, on this regard, there is an important gap in knowledge. First of all, just to say that I, I don't have any kind of conflict of interest, so my, not in the media and the industry and the pharma, not at all. What I say is just based on my experience, whether it's good or bad or whatever, but, but not um, moved by any other reason. So the outline of this presentation that is going to last more or less 20, 25 minutes, no, no more than that, is talking about what is a complex emergency, what we can consider a complex emergency, because as you know, with the war, in, in, in Ukraine, this topic is becoming extraordinarily hot and also have implication on geopolitics and the circumstances in many different countries. The point is that complex emergencies have a very deep impact in TV dynamics. Then we're going to see both together what happens with drug resistant TV in complex emergencies. 
because there are multiple additive challenges and problems, right? In fact, not many people is really um, trying to push uh, MDRTB management in, under these really tough uh, circumstances. Finally, we're going to have an overview of the MRO region, the Middle East uh, region, uh, what is going on, which is the kind of work that people and countries are doing there. Then we're going to try to summarize everything in, in terms of priorities and lesson learned in drug resistance in this kind of complex emergencies. And we're going to provide some very brief results uh, on the drug resistance management in this kind of uh, MRO regions with this particular, and uh, in these countries with these particularities. But before we go into that, uh, just to, to taste a, a little bit to get the flavor of the audience, because you are too many people, we would like to make a poll. Um, Caroline, my, my colleague from the union, is going to help us with that. Uh, the point is that you are going to be offered a votation, right? So in this poll, we are going to ask you this question. Should countries on complex emergencies manage drug resistant TB or should donors, um, should they support them? There are five different answers. Yes, because of humanitarian issues. Yes, because some are delivering excellent results. No, because it can easily lead to increased resistance and many other problems. No, because there are great challenges that they are impossible to, to, to overcome, like diagnosis, supplies, borders. Or no, because there are, um, well, it's, it's already changed. Oh. OK, we have so far nine of you already. I don't know if you can see the screen on real time, but apparently nearly 50% is mentioned that it's possible to have good results. And nearly 30% is saying no, because there are great challenges in diagnosis, supplies, treatment, etc. So we will give just a little bit, few seconds for everyone to participate or at least having a representative number. Okay, so a couple of seconds. So far, okay, some more people is joining. So probably we're going to stop it here. We have um, more than 80% that probably is, it is, right? It's, I'm gonna make a copy and then we will check. Okay, so I will continue with the presentation. Uh, Caroline, if we can stop the, the vote, then we can, we can continue with the, with the presentation. Okay, so this is the question. I obviously I will need to to try to to convince you, right? That this is probably a good idea, or this is probably the most, even believe it or not, the most Russian approach. So, what is a complex emergency? There are the definition from WHO is a situation when there is a disrupted livelihood or threats to life produced by warfare civil disturbances or whatever it is that makes management uh, or makes life really difficult, right? And, and, and people is, is living in difficult political and security environment. So the, it, it can be an open war, right? Um, it can be an interstate conflict or it, it can be an internal conflict, but also there are these situations when, when countries come in and out, right? In, into a, an open fire, right? So there is this kind of chronic conflict that can be lasting more than 10 years and sometimes even more. In all of them, there is a political and economical instability, which means that there is a complete disruption of health systems, right? COVID-19 disruption, it's really a joke uh, in comparison with what is happening with these countries where everything is destroyed, right? So again, in addition, there are problems with migrants, with refugees, with internally displaced population, people goes wherever they find a job or wherever they find any kind of security, food security or just vital, very basic security. So sometimes what they face is multiple of these situations at the same time. And the point is that tuberculosis deaths are a, a, a consequence, a delayed consequence of these conflicts, right? especially of the most vulnerable populations. Um, this is a this graph is really a classic from from descriptive epidemiology as you can see here in the uh, y axis we have death uh, from tuberculosis on what we have in the x and um, uh, on the x um, bar right we have the different years uh, so we see 
the trends in mortality from, from tuberculosis in England and Wales. And as you can see here, there are two important peaks reflecting First World War and Second World War. So again, this is probably something that is already happening in the countries which are in conflict. In fact, um, WHO was, was making really a big echo, right, of these circumstances. And, and during the presentation of the Global Fever Report from 2022, one of the important uh, issues raised at the very beginning is that the TB disease burden could worsen, right, not only because of COVID-19, because there is there's a context of potential, uh, potential war, global energy crisis, and important changes in geopolitics, right? So the point is that probably complex emergency may increase globally. So uh, one year ago, a couple of years ago, we were thinking about doing uh, something on drug resistant TB, right? A, a formal study on drug resistant TB in complex emergency. And in fact, the, the war in Ukraine was just uh, just was just announcing, right, the, the capacity of to rise to put, to rise rise up this this issue, right? So finally, we couldn't make it for this year, but Hopefully, we can make it uh, with the GDI or with the Ember region for 2023. So the point is using the lesson learned from, from these countries on conflict, right, on the Ember region and try to extrapolate to other, to other sites in, in order to check what is really valid, which are the kind of public health interventions that in drug resistance are getting the better yield in terms of diagnosis or enrollment or even sustainability. Okay, so again, which are the the, the consequences of complex emergency in the TV dynamics and services. Obviously, when there is an open world, there's an absolute disrupt of TV services. In fact, the only health services are, are emergencies and, and usually polytrauma emergencies. So when the conflicts temper down, right, uh, there is a moment of reconstruction. And usually um, there is always a remaining political instability. So even if people, if countries are in peace, things are not uh, far from ideal. And sometimes there is like in and out armed conflicts with different attacks, terrorism, new new war, right? So there is an important difficulties in establish solid governments. So this is a, a gap in power, and also this promote corruption. So not really an easy an, an easy scenario. So what happens? Uh, it can be an impact decades after after that, right? So there is an important environment of, of uncertainty. And it's already studied that countries on conflict in less than five years tend to have another conflict, 50% of them. So again, it's an issue. Everything is disturbed for probably decades, and we need to get used to this situation. Again, what remains after the NTP, on the NTPs after the conflict, in terms of human resources, sometimes people is not there, standard operational, uh, standard operational procedures, as we have lost many people and also we have lost the background documents, uh, even if we get new people there, people doesn't know how to do how to do it, right? Again, the, the laboratory network, most of the, the laboratory network is completely destroyed. And what about the TB management network? The hospitals sometimes are already overwhelmed or they are not even there because they are destroyed. The, the BMUs, the TB basic management units, most of them are not working again. And there are important problems with the procurement and supply channels, right? There, is, there are some countries which are under embargo or shipments is absolutely complicated. Getting things in or getting things out is really, really difficult. And usually there is no budget for health because most of the budgets are put on security or in other priorities, but not really in health and especially in chronic conditions. So usually when, when we face TB in complex emergency, there is an important external dependence. So let's go with the, with the hardest yet. And what about drug resistant TB? What is happening there? So again, it, it's like a double side, right? Because uh, conflicts uh, or, or complex emergency are the perfect environment for tuberculosis because it's a social disease driven by comorbidities and also by social determinants. Like, for example, malnutrition, and again, TB is a disease of the poor. But when it comes into drug resistant TB, it's a disease of the poor among the most poor. And we face these situations in, in wars or in conflict. And again, the point is that um, conflicts are a perfect breeding ground from drug resistant TB. 
again, because there are much more of these increased individual vulnerability, like malnutrition, like untreated disease. Uh, for example, we received a report from Ukraine, right, in Spain, that their, their hemoglobin levels with diabetes, it was more than 16 or 17, so not treated at all. So making them much more vulnerable to get infected or to go from infected to having the disease. And again, if we don't treat tuberculosis, there is much more transmission, much more death, and much more disability. And again, if TB or drug-resistant TB is mistreated, uh, what we have is resistance. Let me explain you just a, a very briefly what happens in, in Syria, right? Because there was no hospitals, nearly no physicians, it was really complicated. There were plenty of medications out of the counter. What people call the two-color pill, it was levofloxacin and sometimes moxifloxacin. So forever, for any kind of respiratory disease, but it was there. So medication was was available, sometimes in flakes, sometimes not. But, but again, really a problem with drug resistant TB and antimicrobial resistance may, may emerge. And again, what people have is, is really overcrowded in, 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 in wars, or just people on refugees, on refugee camps, whatever they are, they usually are in, in situations that promote transmission. And again, the cascade of care, as we really know, because we don't have complete figures, but we perfectly know that when countries are not investing in tuberculosis, uh, there's no access to diagnose, there's no enrollment, and of course, the cure rates go down. Or even if the cure rates are high because there is no good network for diagnosis or people is not enrolled, the final yield is really minimal. And again, uh, the point is that there is extraordinarily scarce evidence for what to do in TB in, in complex emergencies. But when, when it comes into drug resistant TB, uh, there's nearly nothing. This is why we were trying to, to get this study done, or at least grasping uh, experiences to, to get priorities. So with drug susceptible and drug resistant TB, the point is that guidelines are developed for, for people managing cases under stable circumstances or acceptable resource or equipped. So in complex emergencies, people cannot follow the guidelines. They, they do what they can, right? Sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad, right? So which are the challenges uh, that we find in this kind of, uh, of situations? The first one is human resources. Um, the key issues is what we face is really a, a brain drain. The younger, um, best qualified, the, the brightest parks of the country, they just leave the country just because of security or, or because they really need it. They have families, they, they need a, a good environment for the growth of the children, and it's perfectly understandable. But the point is that countries are strike, right, by, by the bombs, but they are also strike because they, they lose the young talent. So again, one of the key issues, if people, uh, if countries in these situations are not invested in health, there is very low or directly no governmental payment, right? So most of these physicians or health workers just give up tuberculosis and go to the private services. So uh, again, uh, as an example, please, uh, can you mute one of, of you is already there with some noises over there? Thank you. So um, sometimes what people do is if they don't get any salary, they go to the private sector and maybe they do even both. They work uh, in the morning for the public health, uh, for the public health services, and in the afternoon, they work for the private sector. And, and I also work for the private service. So I, I really know that sometimes the use of antibiotics is not completely rational, right? Of course, private service is really heterogeneous but there can be a, a promotion of, of wide use of antibiotics. And, and sometimes the point is that the private sector is not involved in TB. So the first challenge is, is again, leadership. Uh, whenever we have a, a very good leader, even in very tough conditions, things continue running. But if for any other thing, right, if the leader of the NTP just left the country or is already dead or, or is already too old, uh, these countries are really in, in trouble. Things really tend to collapse. And finally, healthcare workers, right? Uh, the point is that healthcare workers face most of the drug resistant TB complexities, right, in peaceful countries, but they have many other more, right? And, and sometimes these people, they do not receive any kind of training or international training. Even if they have to, to, to really understand because they don't have all the drugs and they don't have all, all the capacities, they need to do something special, right? So they probably would be needing a better training than the others, but this is not a reality, right? Sometimes they, they have to cook with whatever they have, right? So, 
So again, it, it's it's tricky because they can end up doing individualizations or improvisations in practice and TV. Right? And finally, another really critical point is that most of these people that they 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 were not left in the country; they continue leader their NTPs are people from from very old ages, right? Very close to retirement or even beyond the age of retirement. So again, the point is how to transfer these capacities in, in, in these countries with very old people doing a fantastic job. If something happens to them, the whole thing can collapse, right? So leadership is really a, a, a key issue there. So challenge to it would be diagnosis networks. The point is that laboratories frequently are the most heated or, or the first ones to be stolen or, or to be broke or not getting with any kind of supply. So again, human resources, which are very highly skilled people just left away, or if you have um, some casualty, whatever, you, you cannot easily replace, right? All these kind of talented people, they, they just disappear. So again, really a key problem because of human resources, uh, capacities, but also lack of reagents, problems with shipments. So we need really things that, that is standalone, right? Then it's really, it's really a point. Some of the quick solutions, right? If we if we see implementation of some of these countries, okay, we have the money, so let's buy the best equipment. But again, if we don't plan for maintenance, uh, it's going to be a, a point. Sometimes uh, we, we cannot use the best technology or, or we can just go and refurbish something, but, but the electricity remains a problem. So there are no access to spare parts or to calibration of consumables. Again, challenge for transport, sample transportation, right? So there is there is really a, a key issue here, right? Challenge three is treatment capacities, right? Um, the first one is standard operational procedures. As many of these people just left away, and the NTP gets without a staff or without um, uh, trained staff, and sometimes the procedures or, or the historical uh, reflection of, of, of the NTP is lost, right? We, we lose this kind of historical background. People don't really know how to do or what to do. This is, for example, the example in, in Libya. In Libya, during 10, 12 years, everything was destroyed. The guidelines were really um, um, out phase and, and it, it was really necessary to start from the very beginning, right? So again, the point in, in maintenance, right, uh, is really, really a, a key point. So if we have key staff which are maintained in the country and lives in the country, things may work. But if we don't have this kind of leadership or people is not there, the NTP certainly collapse. And what we have is different physicians managing drug resistant TB cases, sometimes for the good and sometimes not in a proper way, right? But we have the scatter experiences. So the treatment, we have the category one, but some of the common mistakes is using widely available second line drugs. So I'm talking directly of chloroquinolones and injectables, right? Which are wide spectrum antibiotics. So again, it reflects and go backwards into yeah, AMR, right? Antimicrobial resistance, right? With uncontrolled use of antibiotics, fakes, and many others. And again, problems with second line drugs equipment, right? And shipment, right? Important problems with delays, with calculations, uh, with lack of diagnosis, and sometimes even embargo. So everything plays against them. And finally, recording and reporting system, which is the backbone, right, of any NTP. Sometimes it's just finally definitely gone, right? But in some places, again, if we have a, an old school leader, um, systems are extraordinarily resilient and continue in paper, right? So which are the additive problems? So in addition of all of these, we have movement of many people. People lose their houses, go for migration, refugees internally displaced. The follow-up is really challenging, right? And there's no DOT or, or, or ways, and there is plenty of transborder TV control. People go to one nation and then goes to another, right? So it's difficult to track the patients and follow up. Again, uh, Pandora's box, right? What happens in, in, in prisons, right? In prisons there are some of these countries, they have plenty of prisoners, right? And in these kind of prisons, the conditions are not good. And again, a perfect environment for drug resistant TB. So again, really a nightmare, right? And as I mentioned, potential increase in antimicrobial resistance, especially affecting fluoroquinolones. And again, a, an increasing role of the private sector that unfortunately usually is not involved or trained in TB and it's difficult to, to get them into the TB field. 
And again, as we mentioned, embargo, customs, shipments, and many other. So is drug-resistant TB really a problem in complex emergency, or do we have rates of drug-resistant TB? Well, not really. The point is that, uh, again, some of these countries have been completely forget, right? And, and there are no way to, to do a prevalence studies first because there are no diagnosed capacities and sometimes because of security. So everything is based on estimations and estimations can be too up or too down. For example, in Iraq that I was there just, just a couple of weeks ago, right? Estimations have changed, right? Probably are better than initially thought, right? And again, just to mention that we don't know, right? There is an important level of uncertainty, but there are present all the ingredients for antimicrobial resistance and of course, drug resistant TB. Again, more transmission, more mistreatment. Again, what happens in prison and detention centers is really an issue. So the challenges are really obvious, right? Uh, but the point is that if we don't treat under NTPs or we don't rehabilitalize the, the NTPs means that there are going to be much more death, much more disability. It's going to perpetuate all family poverty. It, it's going to increase transmission. And finally, uh, we just left the people and treat, but the people is going to ask for treatment. So they are going to probably end up in the private sector being treated well or being mistreated if, if there is no training, right? So... And again, and this is the other side of the coin, all the, the whole lecture is going to change now, we are going to finish. The point is that uh, if properly supported, um, uh, even countries on, on conflict are delivering surprisingly very, very good results, right? So I was telling about the bad news, but there are plenty of good news. So now uh, in the next 10 minutes, very quickly, we're going to present about some successful stories right in the Enro region, right? That covers more or less 600 million population and 22 countries. From these 22 countries, the ones with an asterisk are countries that have been working in directly or indirectly, right? The point is that from these 22 countries, 50% present complex emergencies affecting TV management. But we can divide, for example, these countries in, in active conflict or prolonged conflict or uh, with political instability or um, they are affected in TV, they are affecting because of neighboring uh, conflict, for example, like Jordan and Lebanon, they are not in conflict, but they are receiving plenty of, of refugees and migrants. So priorities and lessons learned very quickly, right? Uh, the countries, what, what I find when I was doing this kind of previous situation analysis that we have like different models, right? When there is an open war or recent peace, uh, usually, if there is no NTP or no resources or no uh, standard operational procedures, probably um, what we find is punctual physicians or private sector managing cases, but the NTP certainly do not exist. So we have to rebuild everything from the very beginning. And it was, for example, uh, of, of Libya and probably also Syria, right? Uh, for example, the case of Libya was extraordinarily challenging because everything, nearly everything was lost. And for Syria, all the infrastructure uh, for diagnosis was completely lost, right? And most of the key NTP. So model B would be a long lasting world, right? But the NTP is very well structured, right? And, and maintained. There are limitations in laboratory, which is really frequent in those countries, but they are, even though they are completely doing, doing a very good job, this is the example of Yemen. And the Model C would be long lasting war or long lasting constant instability, like in Somalia and Sudan, but the point is that here the, there is fragmentation and heterogeneity. Some sides of the country working really well, some others are not. Finally, the Model D would be after the war, but with a very prolonged instability with in and out attacks or open fire, but nearly working close to normal, right? Uh, under this kind of challenging circumstances of, of instability and insecurity it would be the example of Iraq, Afghanistan or Palestine. And the model here is no war, but affected, like for example, Jordan and Lebanon. The point is that this goes in both sides, right? People goes from A to D, but also they can go back, go backwards, right? So circumstances are really volatile, right? And can change very suddenly in a, in a question of months. So which are the lessons learned, right? In drug resistant TV about planning, planning 
it is really important, right, uh, to plan very well according to the uh, according to the real necessities and also the, the sustainability. So we need a very good understanding of TV and, and we need a very good understanding of the political situation, right, in, in the centers, right, because sometimes the priorities from the entity are very different and or class with the priorities of the donor. So again, uh, sometimes the, the kind of donor-driven solution is, okay, let's give the best that we have, but usually the best uh, is behaving like the enemy of the good. Sometimes we need something extraordinarily robust, right, to 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 get autonomy and, and to get sustainability. About human resources, one of the excellent things that NGOs and donors is that they are retaining people in tuberculosis. They they are not going to the private sector. They are not going to other countries. They continue working to be thanks to to these kind of things. So just just to get stable. Uh, people, healthcare workers, but also we really need to train them. Also, we believe that distance support and technical assistance is, is really marking a difference. Or this is what I want to, to believe because this is what I'm doing, right? The point is that we need to, to attract young talent, right? To, to overcome this kind of generational relief and, and keep leadership. Finally, about TB Diagnose Network. Again, the, the, the high tech of highly demanding technology is usually collapsing and also it's eating most of the, of the funding. Again, a sputum smear, chest x-ray, and especially gene expert can really make in a, a difference. Um, everything framing in, 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 in a technology of solar panels, sample distribution, so going to the very basic, right? Maybe not that sexy solution, but certainly the baseline to make things work. And about representative management, um, what we have learned is that things uh, work much better than we initially think of. Of course, there can be a, any kind of survival bias, but countries overall, NTPs, are, are able to achieve very good results. So priorities, first of all, and very quickly, we need an excellent situation analysis. We need budget and plan it, but, but considering that there is going to be an external support but thinking on, on autonomous, right? And making as much autonomous and, and as much sustainable. And try to focus on the problem. What is drug and TV? Specific areas, displaced population, prisons, urban settings, right? Need to adapt. And again, coordination, that it's the, the million dollar question, right? Because sometimes there are many actors, sometimes they are competing for the same grants. So coordination, where, where there are coordination, that there's potential for great synergies in tuberculosis. And again, everything that the living factor need to be autonomous and also a robust solution in terms of diagnosis and management. And again, very basic infrastructure. So opportunities to improve TB control. Again, NGOs, Global Fund, and other international confirm getting really a retention. Other opportunities, conflict stabilization. Most of Middle East um, um, Middle East conflicts are starting to to have more or less calm situation. So there is hope, especially for countries like, like Libya after many years. And again, technology is really supporting and uh, drug resistant TB management. I'm talking precisely about gene expert NTV Reef and also NTV XDR that really makes a difference, even video DOT. Again, all these kind of novelties, shorter regimens, right, is making management very efficient, but also less demanding in terms of follow-up and also uh, with side effects. So probably the regimens in the near future is going to be much more easy, even in these kind of complex emergencies. And finally, trying to have inclusive policies and adaptation of internal standards to the country reality. We really need to empower NTPs, right? So some very brief results, right, in, in, with Enro region. Just for example, for Syria, Syria during the recent years is revitalizing laboratory network, starting drug resistant TB for the first time in more than 10 years, and also updating all RGLC recommendations for Libya. There are new guidelines, and again, restarting drug resistant TB management with very good individual resort for Yemen. Yemen is doing an extraordinary good effort. They are even decentralizing PMDT, with an effective transition right from the old regimens to the new all oral regimens and having an excellent uh, and balanced drug resistant TB cascade. Iraq, again, doing a very good job um, increasing the case notification, confirming with gene expert, right, decentralizing PMDT, even going into the prison. So they are going into the very, very difficult or high complex uh, scenarios and also having an excellent treatment success rate with important commitment of human resources. And finally, Jordan and Lebanon, 
they are doing really an excellent job with all this crisis of migrants and refugees. And here I'm just putting the, the, the Iraq, the very recent uh, Iraq um, cascade of drug risk and TB cascade of care. And as you can see, even if you may think that the results are low on the yield of only uh, finally achieving a cure rate of the 13% of the estimated, just to say that this is twice as big as some other countries in the Embro region. So they are doing an excellent job comparable to those countries with, within peaceful conditions but even better, just telling that with a little bit of effort, countries can do really an excellent job. And just to finalize this, yes, I, I want to acknowledge, right? Uh, because this is only possible not to people like me, not at all, it's only people, um, what they are really working each and every day, which are these kind of sometimes very old physicians, extraordinary resilient people working in resilient entities, and also supported by great countries, right? By IOM, Medicines Since Frontiers, International Red Cross and Red Crescent, WHO Global Fund, and many others. And just to finish with this is that, um, for example, I can go to these countries in and out, and there are some pictures, right? Working in Jordan, in Iraq, whatever, uh, but I'm not putting my life at risk doing my job. Uh, these people is doing that, putting their lives at, at risk each and every day. And, and even though they are continuing committed with TV and doing an excellent job, so I have all my respect to these people really working hard on the field. Thank you very much. And with this, uh, I finish my presentation. Thank you. Hello, I will stop sharing my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Salabjib, you, you are muted. Right. Thank you, Ignacio, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we'll now take some questions uh, from the audience. Any question, comment, anyone from any uh, complex emergency country? So uh, I can't see any questions in the chat, uh, but maybe Charlie, Media, if you have some questions uh, which you have identified, maybe you can share them now. Or if any of the audience, please raise your hand and we can take your question or comments. Okay, so we have one question, uh, Ignacio provided that the biggest uh, gap in DRTB cascade is on diagnosis. How can we make easy bacteriological confirmation in complex emergencies? Well, right again, it's, it's not a, an, easy, an easy question, right? In some of these countries, people cannot move right from one side to another of the country or, or cannot easily change region. So this is why um, this kind of basic management units, they really need to be as much autonomous as possible. Again, the gene expert is one solution, right? And it's an excellent way, uh, but probably this kind of sample, sample, uh, sample transportation channels are extraordinarily necessary. One of the key points is that people diagnose based on clinical facts and also chest X-ray, but we lack uh, bacteriological confirmation. And this is one of the things that we, we really need to, to move forward. And, and again, this is linked to, to the next uh, following presentations on, on how to approach the diagnosis of bacteriologic and how to, to, to get this kind of uh, um, confirmation in, in the different sites, how to approach it, right, to, to then this kind of complex situations. Anyone want to make a, a comment uh, on this, on bacteriological so, confirmation in countries? So Ignacio, I, I think we have some time constraints. So we'll move to the next presentation and we'll keep, you know, we'll request the audience to keep some questions for the end of this session. 
okay thanks so much ignashu that was a wonderful presentation our thank you next speaker is uh, dr alberto roji and he will be presenting on short treatment regimen uptake benefit and challenges in damian foundation supporting countries uh dr alberto roji specializes in infectious diseases and has worked for the university of brescia a who collaborating center as technical advisor for the national tv program of burkina faso uh, he joined the union in 2015 as a consultant to provide technical assistance to ntp in some african developing countries and since 2018 he has been working with damian foundation as medical advisor for projects in african and asian countries he is also damian foundation's focal point for tb infection control so a warm welcome alberto and uh, over to you thank you so much dr sarab it is a great pleasure to present uh, my experience with uh, the minion foundation let me share um uh my screen um could you see my screen yes we can okay perfect perfect so uh thank you so much uh, as i said it's a, it's a great uh, uh, pleasure to me to present uh, my experience uh, and the experience of the demin foundation of in the management of drug resistant tb uh for the next 25 minutes uh, i would like to present uh, some experience on short treatment regimen uptake benefit and challenges in demin foundation supporting countries have no conflict of interest to report so first of all demin foundation um demin foundation is a belgian uh, medical no profit organization that works on tb uh, leprosy and other disease uh, actually we are active in 14 countries uh, across uh, four continents in all these countries we have a demin foundation uh staff that works in collaboration with the national tb program uh, staff uh in this uh, symposium i would like to share our experience on the management of drug resistant tuberculosis in two uh, west african countries guinea and niger uh these two countries are both marked by extreme poverty uh, as you know probably Uh, they are at the least place of the human de development index rankings as, uh, rankings and as you can see um 182 and 189 respectively for guinea and niger the uh, life uh, expectancy at birth for guinea is uh, 62 years old with a prevalence of hiv 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 in the um, population between 15 and 49 years old of 1.5% a prevalence of stunting aid for age in children under 5 uh, years old of 30% regarding um, niger uh, is a country with the difficult accessibility in many regions due to the uh, desert landscape and with a high fertility rate and a prevalence a very low prevalence of hiv both of these countries have an unstable political uh, situation with uh, frequent military stri strikes next year in in guinea we, we had uh, a one military, military strike and uh, terrorist attacks um, very frequent in niger for example as you can see on the map of uh, the niger all territory is uh, a red zone so in this type of setting uh, uh, it's very difficult to plan and uh, prefer uh, supervise peripheral health centers so the supervision of uh, health facility center is also very difficult to carry out the tb active case finding activities and also to organize the transport of the sample to health uh, peripheral health facilities to uh, reference laboratories and also to the national laboratory of reference um if you look at guinea uh, epidemiology of guinea guinea um 
the profile is marked by approximately 19,000 new TB cases per year. Uh, although there is a, has been a significant increase in recent years, uh, the number of cases is still below WHO estimates. As you can see, the estimate uh, is around 24,000 per year. Mm, the uh, mortality has decreased during the last uh, years, as you can see in this slide. If you look to the um, uh, about the NTB strategy milestone for 2020, uh, the target of TB death was not far. Uh, not the same about the TB incidence. As you can see, uh, we have only 0.8% of reduction. reduction. Um, about drug-resistant TB epidemiology in Guinea, um, more or less they have uh, one, uh, 400 patients per year, more or less. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and 100% um, one, uh, of uh, previously treated patients were tested for rifampicin resistance, but not the same for new cases, only 45%, as you can see. This is an important aspect. Um, we have only 58% uh, of patients that know uh, the profile of resistance of chloroquinolone before, uh, before uh, starting treatment. So this is a very important point, and um, it's a key point when we talk also to all uh, oral regimen, and we will see um, during my presentation. So only 58% has this result. What is the uh, drug-resistant TB strategy in Guinea? Uh, over the past five years, uh, this strategy includes the collection of sputum uh, before treatment initiation and uh, monthly for smear and culture during treatment. Uh, the sputum transportation system from TB facility to expert site and national TB laboratory was uh, also uh, present. Um, during the last five years, we had uh, two, two different, three different uh, regimens. Uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, they used, we used the short regimen treatment uh, with the use of, um, uh, with the presence of uh, second line injectable. And uh, for the first two years, 2016, uh, 2017, in parallel with the long regimen. From 2022, um, we uh, introduced the bedaquiline and we replaced uh, a second line injectable with the bedaquiline as recommended for, by the WHO. Uh, two phases, intensive cases and continuation phases, as you know. Uh, during intensive phases, patients in good clinical condition were monitored with ambulatory daily care in MDRTB units. And uh, hospital daily care in, in for patients with sever, severe clinical uh, condition. About the continuation phase, uh, there is this phase uh, ambulatory daily care for patients leaving or accepting to stay in cities with uh, drug resistant TB facilities, or family based care for patients living outside cities with the RTB units so with the one ambulatory visit every one or two weeks. It depends about the the situation. What is the Demon Foundation support uh, in this context? First of all, transport fees from patient home, from home to MDRTB health, health uh, care facilities, fees for systematic clinical and the laboratory monitoring of patient on treatment, nutritional supply, home visit and family counseling, financial support for the procurement of second line drugs, free ancillary drugs to treat adverse events, healthcare work workers training on MDRTB, and monitoring of the RTB activities. This is the technical financial support of the Foundation during the last five years. So some results. Uh, from 2016 to 2021, 
uh, approximately uh, 1,100 1, patients were treated. And with the uh, treatment success of 72%, uh, 17% uh, uh, of death and 3% uh, more or less of uh, failure failure. This is an important uh, element, uh, the number of death in this kind of a context. <clears throat> uh, more or less 44% of, uh, of death uh, were uh, TBHIV co-infected uh, patient. And uh, this is um, due uh, to a kind of uh, difficult in the organization, collaboration with between different actors. So between NGO that works on HIV patients, but also between a national TB program and national HIV program. And so it means that uh, uh, patients come to healthcare in a very advanced state of, of disease. So uh, we have this kind of, um, of rate about that. If we look to different regimen and result by regimen, uh, we can see that uh, with the long regimen, we had uh, a uh, treatment success of 57% with a higher uh, rate uh, of um, loss to follow up and died. And um, for the short regimen treatment uh, with injectable and uh, uh, from 2022 with, uh, with the all oral regimen with bed acting, we have we had and we have 73% of uh, success, but 3% uh, uh, of uh, bedaclin uh, treatment are not yet assessed. About the, the delay to start treatment, um, this delay has improved during the last years. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to assistance in setting up the sample transport network to reference laboratories and the increase of the number of expert facilities in the country. So actually, we uh, the delay is more or less seven days to start the treatment. About uh, monitoring and follow-up, I would like to point out that uh, for this project, uh, no follow-up uh, was performed at six and 12 months after cure, and the uh, electronic database for adverse events uh, was developed only in 2020 into, uh, into hospitals. So we have to analyze this kind of, um, of result uh, or the information. If you talk about uh, Niger, it's a different uh, situation in terms of epidemiology. Um, this country notifies more or less uh, 13,000 new TB cases per year with a rather stable incidence in, uh, in the recent uh, years and uh, a marked improvement in death uh, due to uh, death losses. About <clears throat> the anti-B strategy milestone for 2020, you can see that we have 16% uh, of reduction if we talk about TB death and a 17% of reduction if we talk about uh, TB incidence. Drug resistant TB uh, in Niger, uh, for the RTB aspects, uh, uh, they notified 100 new cases per year, more or less, and 91% um, of previously treated cases uh, were tested, are tested for uh, rifampicin resistance, so a high level of, uh, of uh, good result for this kind of indicator, but only 11% of new cases. Another important thing is that uh, all uh, patients that started treatment uh, uh, are tested for resistance to any chloroquinolone. This is a very important uh, aspect. The strategy for the RTB man uh, management in Niger includes uh, the collection of sputum specimen before treatment initiation and the monthly for smear and culture during treatment. Uh, the sputum transportation system from TB facilities to expert uh, 
sites and national TB laboratories was also present. From <clears throat> 2008, uh, some regimen had been used. So from 2008 to 2013, uh, uh, we used a short uh, regimen treatment with the use of gatifloxacin. From uh, 2013 to 2020, we used a short regimen treatment with uh, moxifloxacin and injectable. But uh, from 2015, uh, we use a different approach, uh, a cascade approach. So it means that uh, when uh, we had uh, uh, some adverse effect due, due to second line injectable, we replaced this injectable with linezolid. And uh, in the last year, uh, a bedeclin based treatment uh, uh, was uh, used in case of failure of this, uh, this regimen. From April 2021, uh, the country has introduced uh, uh, a regimen with the use of edacilin and linezolid and chlorophenone. Um, there, 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 there was a systematic clinical and laboratory monitoring of patient treatment. Uh, the Foundation support the country for transport fees, nutritional support, on visit and contact tracing of patient. And uh, a follow-up was performed at six and 12 months after cure. Result outcomes. So uh, from 2008 to 2020, uh, we had 81.6% uh, uh, of cure relapse free with 11.2% uh, of death and 3.5% of failed. If we look to the failed and relapse, so 23 patients, five died before starting a salvage reg regimen. And uh, I would like to point out that 16 were cured with a beta killing based treatment. So it means that uh, if we look at total good outcomes, we, 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 can, we can add these uh, 16 patients. And so we had a favorable outcome of more or less 85%, more or less. Um, if we look regimen by regimen, uh, result in a short regimen treatment with second line injectable, with, so it means no modified regimen. We had 82% of success with 10% uh, 10, 10 of uh, death. And uh, among the 22 patients with failure and relapse, 18 had initial resistance to chloroquinolone. So it means that uh, before the, the, the start of the treatment, we didn't have this kind of information. If you look to <clears throat> the outcome of modified short protein regimen, so it means with the linezoli, um, we had 75%, 76% of success rate with zero relapse one year after cure. The delay start to start in treatment uh, has improved during the last years. And actually we, we can start the treatment in five days more or less. So uh, about um, adverse, effects. Um, we did an analysis of data from 2008 to 2017. In terms of frequency, gastrointestinal adverse effects were the most common, but in terms of severity, hearing loss was the most reported and is related to the second line injectable, as you know. Indeed, we have 2% of grade 3 and 2% of grade 4, as you can see we were able to manage other kind of uh, uh, adverse effects, especially for peripheral neuropathy. If you look of this kind of uh, adverse effect by um, strategy or regimen, uh, we can see that during the first five years from 2008 to 2013, uh, the monitoring of adverse effects 
was only clinical, so clinical monitoring. And we, um, we uh, suggested uh, an adiometry only at the end of the intensive, care, intensive case. If there was a hearing loss, canamycin was, rep uh, was replaced by uh, capriomycin, capriomycin or the, the frequency of uh, canamycin was uh, reduced three times per week. In this context, with this strategy, we had the 1.7 of grade three hearing um, loss and the 3.4 of grade four. Uh, something changed when we start with bimonthly audiometry and with the reduction of frequency of uh, canamycin three times per week. So from 2015 to 2015. In this period, we have 1.4 of grade through three and 1.4 of grade four. The approach with the, uh, in the where, when the canamycin was replaced by linezolid uh, in this with bimonthly audiometry, we have only 1.5 grade three uh, adverse events and no grade four. So in conclusion, um, a comprehensive nationwide approach to MDR-TB management using the short treatment regimen was feasible and successful in the foundation supporting countries. Patient with failure or relapse after short, uh, short treatment regimen contain, containing injectable were success, successfully treated with bedaquiline based regimen. Hairy loss was manageable replacing the injectable with the uh, So we have to, um, improved two aspects. Monitoring of effectiveness uh, and uh, about the acquisition of resistance to fluoroquinolone and bedaquiline. So with the oil oral regimen, we have to be sure that when we start the treatment, we, we don't have any resistance to fluoroquinolone. So we have to improve it. We have to invest of this kind of control. And also we have to improve the management of and monitoring of uh, adverse events in some countries. Guinea is uh, an example. And uh, that's all for my side. I would like to thank the Ministry of Health and the, the National TB program of Guinea and Niger, our patient, uh, our local staff and our partners. Thank you so much. So about the uh, question, uh, the whole presentation, TB drug resistance management in setting characterized by wars and political instability raised challenges at several levels. What aspect do you think have the greatest impact on patient care? So please uh, put your hands where in this kind of question. Uh, moment of two uh, participation. So no doubt for the participants, okay. Um, this, the first was the presence of nutritional supply and transport fee support. The second one was is a close monitoring of side effects. Second, light drugs availability, regular laboratory data availability, and all the points mentioned above are necessary to reach good outcomes. Okay, so now we have. I think the most part of participation has been answered. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if we can hand all question or not. I stop share my presentation. Okay.
So thank you so much. And I give the floor to Dr. Sarajit. Uh, thanks, Alberto. I'll hand it over to my co-chair, Margaret. Margaret, over to you. Thank you. Um, can you see me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I will just proceed now to introduce the next speaker. So the next speaker is Dr. Sofia Georgiou. Um, who is a molecular epidemiologist with postgraduate training in molecular biology um, and uh, global health from the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Giorgio has over a decade of infectious disease research experience, working with many different academic institutions, clinical laboratories, and industry partners. Uh, she has contributed to a diversity of uh, NTD, HIV, and TB research projects. Uh, Dr. Giorgio joined the TB program at FIND in August 2016. Her work has informed WHO review and guidelines development, uh, group meetings, as well as technical documents for the use and implementation of TB diagnostics. So, uh, Dr. Giorgio, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I hope you can all see my screen. And I'll yes. also say, please do feel free to put any comments and questions in the chat as I work through this. But I'm very happy to be here today um, to talk about the TB diagnostic gaps undermining current regimens. My only conflict of interest is that I am an employee of FIND. Uh, we do work closely with private and public sectors and receive funding from donors and some of our industry partners. You can find full information on our policies and guidelines for working with private sector partners on our website. I know that most of the talks have gone through drug resistant TB in depth, uh, just to remind everyone of the definitions we're talking about here. And these were updated following a WHO expert consultation on these definitions with publication here in January 2021. So RRTB is used to refer to rifampicin-resistant TB. MDR-TB, or multidrug-resistant TB, designates rifampicin and isoniazide-resistant tuberculosis. Pre-XDR-TB, or pre-extensively drug-resistant TB, designates rifampicin and fluoroquinolone-resistant TB, whereas XDR-TB now designates rifampicin, fluoroquinolone, ambidacolin and or linezolid-resistant TB. So we're all very well aware that COVID-19 continues to negatively impact access to TB diagnosis and treatment. Apart from COVID-19, TB is the leading cause of death from a single infectious agent. And COVID-19 has reversed over a decade of progress and continues to have a damaging impact on access to TB diagnosis and treatment. We've seen this in an increased number of people with undiagnosed and untreated TB, an increased number of TB deaths, more community transmission, and increased numbers of people developing TB. Between 2019 and 20, there was a fall in the number of people treated for rifampicin-resistant MDR-TB, which approximates about one in three of those in need. And the estimated number of deaths from TB increased between 2019 and 2021, which reversed years of decline. If we look at the numbers, we saw 10.6 million people develop TB in the last year, including 0.45 million drug-resistant TB cases, and 1.6 million died of the disease. Of those 10.6, only 4.2 million were, well, 4.2 million were undiagnosed. So globally, only about 63% of pulmonary TB cases are bacteriologically confirmed. And also to say that you know, without, without treatment, the death rate from TB is about 50%. The good news is that novel TB treatment regimens have the potential to accelerate WHO and TB efforts. And these new regimens are generally safer, they're generally shorter, and better tolerated by patients. So this offers great gains in terms of TB control and our path to end TB. However, efficacy of these regimens remains dependent on confirmation of disease and detection and or rule out of resistance to key drug compounds prior to treatment. 
and testing remains the weakest link in the cascade of error care that must be addressed to urgently support global recovery. Looking at the number of global new TB case notifications, we see this great drop in the number of people newly diagnosed with TB and notified, moving all the way from 7.1 million in 2019 to 5.8 million in 2020, which is about an 18% decline back to levels of 2012. And this is just a small portion of the approximately 10 million people who developed TB in 2020. Not only is there a major diagnostic gap, but as we see in the right, there is also this critical treatment gap. And we see that less than half of those with drug-resistant TB are being diagnosed, if we look at the blue line, and treated in red. One key reason for this is that existing tools are simply not fit for purpose. A WHO-recommended molecular test was used for diagnosis only about 38% of the time. Moreover, the majority of patients enter the care cascade in lower level or community or primary healthcare centers without necessarily the infrastructure or the capacity to diagnose TB. Also reliance on sputum misses the most vulnerable patients in the spectrum of TB disease. And what I'm gonna focus on with this talk is that no WHO endorsed molecular diagnostics are available for detection of resistance to many drug compounds including some of the newer compounds that we rely so heavily on in new regimens. If we look at WHO endorsed diagnostics to date, the gaps become quite obvious. This table shows the various drugs in our arsenal, which are arrayed at the top. And on the left-hand side is the designations of different tests for drug resistance determination. First, we have low complexity automated NATs or nucleic acid amplification tests. These are technologies that approach near point of care. And here we're talking about gene expert type technologies and TrueNet. So gene expert MTB RIF and ultra assays and TrueNet MTB with a reflex RIF chip get us part of the way and focusing on just rifampicin resistance detection with the new expert XDR assay allowing for expanded resistance detection for isoniazide, fluoroquinolones, amikacin and ethionamide resistance detection. Moderate complexity automated NATs include more centralized DST solutions, such as the Abbott, Hain, BD, and Roche solutions. These technologies, however, only detect resistance to rifampicin and isoniazide at the moment. They're higher throughput, but this also means that uh, due to the workflow, these are limited more towards higher level centers and process many samples at once. High complexity reverse hybridization based NATs include the line probe assays. The first line, line probe assays detect resistance to rifampicin and isoniazide. Second line, Hain LPA allows us to see fluoroquinolone resistance, amikacin resistance. And the PZA LPA from NIPRO also detects pyrazinamide resistance, but is a standalone assay. And these technologies, again, are limited towards higher level reference center as they required quite a lot of training and a, a very well-detailed lab protocol for conduct. For phenotypic DST, we cover most of the drugs in our arsenal, and they, these include the Midget system and 7H10, 7H11, LJ Media. However, we all know that these technologies take a long time to perform, and again, are limited to those higher level reference center. I should also mention that the growing pipeline of diagnostics will only partly start to fill in this table, especially with technologies that are more appropriate for those lower level community and primary healthcare centers. As technologies such as sensitizer plates, uh, minimum inhibitory concentration testing on those plates, and sequencing for which evidence is currently being generated for almost all these drugs are unlikely to really penetrate down to those lower level settings. Looking at molecular diagnostic cascades for the programmatic management of drug-resistant tuberculosis, we can also highlight the drugs for which we are currently blind to resistance for various treatment regimens that are currently recommended for the treatment of drug-resistant TB. Often, clinicians must empirically treat patients without confirmation of resistance, given that resistance to many of these drugs can only be detected using phenotypic methods. 
And we all know this can select for resistance if inappropriate compounds are chosen. This can also worsen patient outcomes and really leave the door open for transmission of resistant strains. A note here, so this shows a diagnostic cascade suitable for lower level healthcare centers. Here we really only have those expert and true NAT technologies available for quick or rapid diagnosis of resistance. And these type of technologies are more suitable for those intermediate and peripheral labs with limited infrastructure, where we assume technicians have adequate training to perform these diagnostics in one to two hours. Samples could also be referred to centralized laboratories given rapid and safe transport of specimens, as well as expedient results reporting. But we also need to consider here that we need to offer rapid molecular testing for treatment non-responders in this cascade to determine whether there's acquired resistance. This shows a molecular diagnostic cascade for more suitable for higher level healthcare centers. And we can see here that although there's this larger array of tests available, a lot of those centralized DST solutions, including COBUS, BD, the real time, MTB RIF, INH assays, fluorotype, as well as the older Hain first line LPA expert would also be available in these settings. We still see that we're blind to resistance to many of the key drugs in our arsenal, especially bedacolin, pertominid, linezolid, and pyrazinamide resistance for many of these regimens. Again, this is a diagnostic cascade suitable for higher level health centers. These are typically reference labs with sufficient infrastructure, well-established networks, and trained personnel to run higher throughput and complex molecular tests. We also need to consider rapid molecular testing of treatment non-responders in these settings to determine acquired resistance. And one thing not shown, but the NIPRO PZA LPA might also be, be used at any point in this cascade to evaluate pyrazinamide resistance. So knowing these TB treatment gaps and the really the drugs for which we're blind to resistance, you know, what are the key diagnostics needed? Well, we know that more generally lower level health care centers require simple screening and diagnostic tests, especially rapid non-sputum based solutions for TB and drug resistant TB detection. Higher level reference labs may implement more complex assays for TB and expanded resistance detection including higher throughput and multi-disease platforms to help increase efficiency of testing. Targeted next-generation sequencing, which I have not mentioned, but it, this enables comprehensive DST directly from sputum and is becoming increasingly appropriate for intermediate healthcare levels. There are several sequencing instruments now that are commercially available, uh, such as from Thermo Fisher, Fisher Oxford Nanopore, and they're designed to be relatively effective, more appropriate for use in decentralized lab settings, whereas larger, more expensive instruments of higher throughput are also available, though these would be limited to higher level reference laboratories. But to preserve new drugs and regimens, the detection specifically of linezolid, bedaclin, nitroamidazole, and pyrazinamide resistance in high burden settings must be a research and implementation priority. So we know what the key drug resistant TB assays and the needs are here, but how do we begin to design assays to address specific needs in various settings? Looking at the most important drugs in our arsenal, bedaclin is among the top. As one of the highest priority drugs, this drug is important to the six month new BPAL and BPAL-M regimens, and as an add-on agent for the long drug resistant TB regimen. Well, clofazamine, a related drug, features as an add-on agent for the short drug-resistant TB regimen. Bedaclin has a very long half-life, which helps contribute to resistance development, and resistance has been documented already in isolates, even from patients without prior exposure to the drug. Although the risk of treatment failure is likely high for patients in which bedaclin resistance is not diagnosed prior to treatment, Currently, only phenotypic methods exist to determine resistance to this drug. One reason for this, and the reason that a molecular assay has yet to be forthcoming, is the fact that the resistance landscape for this drug is so complicated. 
There are multiple gene targets and the resistance landscape within each gene target is incredibly complicated. Bedaclin resistance involves long stretches of several genes that harbor a range of mutations, including neutral polymorphisms that would have to be accounted for in any assay. And in the 2021 WHO mutations catalog, no mutations met the established confidence grading criteria for associated association with bedaclin or clofazamine resistant phenotypes. So as you can see here, looking, looking at this short graph of the frequency of bedaclin resistance mutations in a large pool of isolates, we see that many mutations are only found in just a couple isolates, and the mutations are spread throughout multiple gene systems that must be accounted for. When we're starting to think about molecular or targeted rapid DST approaches, we need to start prioritizing designs that include rule out resistance assays, meaning that you incorporate all wild type sequences or neutral polymorphisms into an assay and detect mutations different from wild type. And essentially you're saying that resistance can be ruled out if all, all the sequence is wild type or neutral but otherwise resistance cannot be ruled out. So these type of assays must cover large swaths of multiple genes with the possibility of adding in probes or primers as confidence grows in specific markers. There might be possibilities as well for rule in resistance assays. And these are more what we think about these targeted mutation detecting assays that determine if a resistance mutation is present. But these assays would be based upon limited information. Possibly we could include ATPE A63V here, which we know has some association with poor clinical outcomes and MMPR regions where we do see a cluster of resistance mutations. But sequencing should also be considered a valuable approach here, both for detection of resistance, but also to grow that knowledge base of the bedaclin resistance mechanisms. Looking back at those diagnostic cascades for low, lower level healthcare centers and higher level healthcare centers, and the specific regimens we're talking about here, we see that the likely best use case for such an assay would be as a reflex test. This would possibly be a follow-on assay to an HR result or isoniazide rifampicin result along with moxifloxacin to help inform uh, eligibility for the BPAL regimens but also to inform add-on eligibility for inclusion in both the MDR short and long regimens, especially for patients with prior drug exposure and those with poor response to therapy. But sequencing should remain a priority for this drug in any setting where it's available, at least to rule out resistance in the interim and help inform the field. The next drug I will talk about is linezolid. This is an oral antibiotic important, again, to multiple regimens, including the recommended six-month BPAL and BPAL-M regimens, and as an add-on agent for the long drug-resistant TB regimen. Clinically relevant resistance to this drug is a concern given that the optimal drug dosing and treatment duration remain undefined, especially in the context of mitochondrial toxicity. And there is some evidence of resistance increasing already in TB programs. The risk of treatment failure is likely high if linezolid resistance is not detected prior to treatment, but the only methods of resistance detection to date are phenotypic DST in 7H10, 7H11, and midget media. Linezolid, thankfully, is one of the clearest drugs for inclusion in molecular assays to date. The reason for this is that the majority of global phenotypic resistant looks to be associated with two mutation hotspots that cluster between two genes. That's the 23S rRNA and 50S ribosomal protein L3 genes. Only RPLC C154R was associated with resistance in the WHO catalog. And unfortunately, that means that an assay it, that just includes this mutation would only have an approximate global sensitivity of just 38.2%, as you can see from the graph. But an assay including this mutation alone would an be anticipated to have some high world diagnostic performance in settings where bedaclin resistance might be more common. There, there is also possible RRL targets that could be included in a targeted assay where we do see some mutation clusters, 
that could help in increase sensitivity of such a targeted assay. For rapid DST approaches, this is one of the few drugs where we could start to consider a rule in resistance assay that targets specific mutation clusters. But a rule out resistance assay would also be acceptable given that linezolid resistance prevalence is still low globally. And again, sequencing will be critical to expand our knowledge base and also help to, to diagnose resistance in the interim. Looking at those diagnostic cascades for lower level and higher level centers, we again see that the likely use case would be as a reflex assay for such, an, for such a targeted molecular test. Again, this would be a follow-on assay to an HR result along with moxifloxacin to inform eligibility for BPAL or inform add-on eligibility for the MDR long regimens, especially in patients with the prior drug exposure and those with poor response to therapy. But sequencing, again, should remain a priority, at least to rule out resistance and help inform the field. For the nitroamidazoles, we're talking specifically about protominid and delaminid. And these drugs are important for treatment of rifampicin-resistant or MDRTB patients on the BPAL or longer regimens. And there's very promising treatment outcome data for all these regimens to date. There are concerns for resistance, especially considering rates of mutation frequencies and baseline resistance, as, and these concerns are heightened given the fact that phenotypic DST and sequencing are not yet widely established nitromidazole testing methods. Again, here we're looking at a very complicated picture of resistance. We see that any loss of function mutation in the F420 pathway enzymes is thought to confer cross-resistance. There are many genes, I've listed six here, implicated within that pathway. And yet we've seen even be, between all those genes, about 10 to 17% of phenotypically predominant resistant isolates have no mutations in these genes. So there's likely other resistance mutations that we're missing. Only one mutation, DDN-L49P, received an interim designation in the WHO mutations catalog as associated with delaminid resistance. An issue here is that an assay detecting only this mutation would have a theoretical sensitivity for global delaminid resistance detection of about 6%. So we see that more research is urgently needed for these drugs in particular to define those nitroamidazole resistance me mechanisms. Furthermore, the extent of cross-resistance between protominid and delaminid remains undefined. For rapid DST approaches, we have to consider a rule-out assay here for resistance detection, as the picture of resistance is simply too complicated for a molecular targeted assay at this time. Again, op open assays are desirable, those type of assays that cover very large swaths or whole genes to really allow for probe addition as our knowledge evolves. And sequencing will be critical to expand that knowledge base of resistance mechanisms. Looking at those diagnostic algorithms, again, we would see a use case of, as a reflex assay especially a follow-on assay to an HR result, again with moxifloxacin to help inform BPAL eligibility and add-on eligibility for the MDR short and long regimens for patients with prior exposure and those with poor response to therapy. But sequencing, especially here, should remain the priority, at least to rule out resistance and help inform the field. The last drug I will focus on, although not necessarily a new drug here, but pyrazinamide is critical to multiple regimens. This drug has activity against persister bacilli, and we also know it has a synergistic effect with multiple drugs, including first-line compounds and bedacolin and the nitroamidazoles. So it's important to multiple regimens, including the drug susceptible TB regimen, uh, monoisoniazide resistant TB regimen, and as an add-on agent for the short and long regimens. Resistance to this drug has been fairly well characterized globally. We see rates of about zero to 25% among drugs, drug susceptible TB patients, and 40 to 90% among rifampicin resistant or MDR TB patients, depending on geographical context. The risk of treatment failure is fairly low if PZA resistance is not 
assessed prior to HRZ therapy, but we do see that risk beginning to increase with the drug-resistant TB regimens. Only two WHO-recommended DST options exist today, and neither are perfect. Those are the Genoscolor PZA-TB2 assay from Nipro and Midget Phenotypic DST, but both these technologies are limited to high-level reference laboratories. Pyrazinamide resistance is tied, as we know, to just a single gene target. But again, the resistance landscape is complicated, which is why we're not seeing any of those molecular targeted assays today. We're talking here about a 561 base pair gene and promoter, so it's a large landscape to cover. And resistance mutations are spread throughout the gene. And we also see many indels within PNCA and neutral polymorphisms that must be accounted for. In the latest WHO catalog, we saw 105 mutations specifically associated with resistance to pyrazinamide. So designing an assay for this is incredibly complicated. And I think the picture of the PZA LPA does help to represent that. For rapid DST approaches, this PZA LPA is still a valuable tool to detect resistance. Uh, and the idea behind here is again, almost a rule out resistance assay where you incorporate all known neutral polymorphisms into a targeted assay and detect any differences from that wild type sequence. Enzymatic assays can also help in the interim to kind of bridge that gap between targeted molecular assays and phenotypic testing by offering some indication of resistance profiling. Though again, these assays are not perfect. They're limited more to higher level reference labs and they require require quite a bit of work and don't have an instant turnaround time. But sequencing continues to be important, you know, to help define that basis of resistance and to diagnose resistance in the interim. We know the pyrazinamide is important to almost all regimens in our arsenal. And here we can start to talk about not just a use case as a reflex assay, but also as a first line resistance assay. This drug has value as an initial assay alongside isoniazide and rifampicin resistance to inform monoisoniazide resistant regimens. It can also inform treatment for patients with prior drug exposure and those with poor response to therapy. But there's also this use case and probably a more important use case as a reflex assay. So there's value here in follow-up testing given initial isoniazide and rifampicin assay results and to inform eligibility for inclusion in additional regimens, including the MDR short and long TB regimens. Sequencing should remain a priority for this drug, at least to rule out resistance and to help inform the field in the interim. For future technologies and directions, we know that the global burden of both drug susceptible and resistant TB mostly impacts our lowest resource settings. For that reason, we not only need to consider, you know, all of these various molecular considerations for diagnostic developments, but also how to get to the point of near patient connected molecular technologies that will really benefit patients in these settings. Molecular TB assays to date typically interrogate just a single relatively small gene region for any drug. And here you can start to think about those true nat RIF assays, uh, expert MTB, RIF, and ULTRA. And a targeted rule-in resistance strategy such as this would only be appropriate for a drug such as linezolid. So we know that resistance can mostly be tied to RPLC, one mutation, and the RRL gene. If we include these different regions in any assay, we can start to think how we might design a targeted molecular assay that would be appropriate to cover these. If we re-envision the landscape of the expert XDR assay, for example, we could remove those lower hanging targets such as HPC, which has just a very small role in isoniazide resistance, and RRS and EIS targets, which are implicated in second line injectable drug resistance, which are being phased out of many regimens today. And that would free up three additional reporters to cover those RPLC and RRL gene regions, which would eventually get you to an assay that covers isoniazide, fluoroquinolone, and linezolid resistance. 
but also alternative molecular strategies will be needed, such as rule out resistance approaches to profile those large complex genes with a wide variety of mutations, as we've seen for bedacolin, the nitromidazoles, and pyrazinamide, but also co continued investment in targeted sequencing approaches. We know that targeted NGS can get us comprehensive DST straight from sputum, and there's also possibilities for high throughput testing with targeted NGS. Though there are these open questions about the price point and training and infrastructure requirements that question whether this technology will filter down to lower level healthcare settings. I do wanna stress, however, that now is not the time to lose momentum. We have all these COVID-19 innovations coming through the pipeline, and these are also suitable for TB screening and detection at point of care and near point of care. These technologies can be leveraged for TB and should be, and this is something we're looking forward to, just both for TB detection as well as drug-resistant TB detection. These can include non-sputum-based tests such as aerosol-based TB detection, uh, swab-based TB detection, and we're looking at how resistance can also factor into those type of assays. We, should, we also need to focus on rule in linezolid resistance assays and rule out PZA, bedacolin, and nitromidazole resistance assays for all levels of the healthcare system. And exploiting that increased capacity for sequencing thanks to COVID-19 for whole genome sequencing of drug-resistant TB isolates and growing that collective knowledge base of drug-resistant TB resistant mechanisms. Here I have put up the public call put out by WHO for whole genome sequencing and phenotypic data from clinical isolates, which will help grow that knowledge base and get us to the next version of the mutations catalog, which will also have that role of help informing the next generation of molecular DRTB diagnostics. To conclude, I'd like to say that to NTB, we really cannot afford to lose a single drug in our antibiotic arsenal. We are rolling out these regimens without adequate or sufficient diagnostics to detect resistance, and we know that a lot of resistance is already prevalent throughout the world. The key needs right now include TB and drug-resistant TB diagnostics that can be used at or near point of care, an effective rapid molecular drug susceptibility test for new drugs, including rule-in resistance assays for linezolid, rule out resistance assays for PZA, bedacolin, and the nitromidazoles. But we also need to continue to keep filling these knowledge gaps that remain with us through routine sequencing and MIC testing. And one part of that is to exploit this increased capacity for sequencing to promote integrated next generation sequencing approaches at intermediate healthcare levels. So I'd like to thank the fine TB team who is working hard in all these areas uh, to try and bring this field forward, as well as all, all of our funders who are supporting these efforts. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. So thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Georgiou, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we can see in the chat box that there is one question and two comments, and maybe starting with the comments is really uh, the need for the, the, the rapid uh, DST uh, assays when they are available to be made available for the NTP program to really inform uh, treatment of patient, though at the same time highlighting uh, the programmatic challenges in the cascade of care uh, with the need really to uh, address uh, challenges such as the need for a second specimen uh, for further DST testing uh, in some settings. So I think those points are well taken. And then the question, uh, there is a question about what is the rate of primary uh, versus secondary resistance to bedaquidin and linezolid? Um, yeah, so we are running short on time, so maybe you can uh, uh, address the question now, or also we have opportunities during the discussion, which will be happening later on. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thankful. <laughs> thankfully, I'll just say briefly, you know, the rates, the rates of resistance to all these drugs are still very low and still being defined. Um, we, I would recommend actually looking back at some of the union talks that were given this year, 
as it's interesting to see that the rates can be very high in certain settings. So I think there were a couple of Bedaclin presentations that did see rates creep up. Uh, I don't have the numbers at hand, but I will look up those numbers during the break, but I want to say around 5% um, of, of cases within a single study in a short period of time, we're starting to see those resistant rates creep up. But it's, it's clear that, you know, we're already seeing resistance to these drugs, which are some of the most important drugs in our arsenal, as we heard from the past talks. So the time for diagnostics, diagnostics are needed now, uh, whether or not those resistant rates are are creeping up because we know they will be, you know, if we we don't adequately and quickly detect diagnose or diagnose resistance to these drugs. So thank you for the question. Thank you. And so I will be moving over to the moderator, for, uh, which will take us to the break, I think. Uh, thank you. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will break for five minutes. Uh, so, participant, may I recommend you that you do not log off uh, from uh, Zoom meetings. I'm just going to put a timer on the screen so you know when to come back. So, uh, uh, we will resume in five minutes. Dr. Margaret or Dr. Surabjit? Right. Hi. Uh, welcome back. So we'll go to the second part of this session and we'll have a presentation <clears throat> by Dr. Shaheed Wali Omar on country experience of use of DST for drug resistant TB. Uh, So Dr. Shahid Wali Omar holds a PhD in medical microbiology and focuses on the mycobacterium TB research, uh, which he's been doing for over a decade. He is currently the acting head of the Center for TB at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in South Africa and leads diagnostic evaluations, drug resistance surveillance, molecular epidemiology, and application of novel technologies. He has been instrumental in implementation of lab applications for diagnosis and surveillance, shaping the capacity to include advanced phenotypic testing and NGS applications. He also serves on several local and international TB consortia and committees, advising policy guidance. Uh, over to you, Dr. Omar. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for those who are in the morning. Um, so I'm just going to give you a light presentation of the country experience as a South Africa for drug susceptibility testing supporting drug resistant TB. My conflicts of interest. Okay, so just to give you a context of the National Health Laboratory Service in South Africa. It was established in 2001 by parliament as a lab service for the country. It is the largest pathology service in South Africa. It services primarily the state sector, which is about 80% of the population and more than 90% for the TB. It covers all the pathology disciplines, including forensics. The key mandates of the National Health Laboratory Service is diagnostic service, then training, so we train pathology staff as well as research. Under the bigger organization, we have divisions and subsidiaries, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, where I'm based. These house the reference laboratories responsible for surveillance and monitoring of communicable diseases and also includes the cancer registry. In addition, we have the National Institute of Occupational Health, the priority programs, which is responsible for implementation at scale of services in support of TB and HIV programs, South African vaccine producers, 
and diagnostic media producers. This is an overview of the country, which is, which is divided by nine provinces. And this is just the landscape of the diagnostic services offered by the National Health Laboratory Service. There's over 200 laboratories marked in green that serves approximately 5,000 healthcare facilities across the country. And this is, of course, uh, distributed by density of population. So just to give you an overview of TB diagnostics, the introduction and supporting change in regimens in South Africa. So to, if we focus on the treatment regimens, but Aquilin was introduced in South Africa around 2012. And during this process up to 2015, it, it was a clinical access program where patients were put onto bedaquilin and they had to be pre-XDR or XDR. And then we received registration approval. During this period, the lab services supported the, the, the use of bedaquilin by metered PDST and the line probe assays, but not particularly bedaquilin testing. The short regimen was then introduced in 2017, and then in 2018, we announced the ejectable free regimen. And during this process, we then implemented the gene expert ultra assay, which was uh, the smear, it replaced smear microscopy in the country and was the primary diagnostic use. To support the introduction of the short regimen, we then introduced what we call the DRTB reflex testing. And this included the line probe assays first and second line, as well as phenotypic DST for isoniazid, fluoroquinolone, and capriomycin. Once the injectable free regimen was introduced, we will, we will, the, we will then introduce lenizolid and levofloxacin testing routinely across the network, and then later on bedaquilin in around 2019. And during the absence of testing in the routine diagnostic laboratories, the reference laboratory supported testing for bedaquilin, lenizolid, clofazamine, delaminate, and non-routine drugs, as well as the utilize whole genome sequencing to support certain decisions. So what I'm showing you here is an overview of the tuberculosis diagnostic algorithm for the country. Our first point of our first test is the gene expert. And if you're gene expert positive and rifampicin susceptible, we are then started on a standard treatment for susceptible TB. If you are gene expert resistant, we then treat you as MDR, and then you will move on to a second specimen, which moves over to the DR reflex algorithm. If ampersand unsuccessful, we would then also move over to the reflex algorithm. And in cases where, you, where your gene expert is negative, but you are HIV positive, we will then collect the specimen for, for, for culture and, and additional workup in the laboratory. Going through the DR reflex algorithm, once you are gene expert rough ampersand resistant or uh, gene expert negative and HIV positive, we will collect the second specimen, decontaminate, and then perform the line probe assays for first and second line. Should this be unsuccessful, we would then wait for immediate culture and then complete the for the molecular workup on line probes. And then based on your resistant patterns, we will then do additional phenotypic testing, um, uh, or, or, or testing workup. So <clears throat> during this period, we've developed an extensive diagnostic capacity. Currently, the TB laboratory network, in terms of routine laboratories, we have 213 gene expert ultra sites across the country. We have 15 TB culture and first line LPA, nine LPA first and second line, and then we have six uh, sites that support the DR reflex testing. And this includes uh, phenotypic testing to bedaquilin, levofloxacin, lenizolid, and in some laboratories, clofazamine. The reference laboratory then also offers uh, support to the routine services for drug resistance particularly in cases where they are failing standard regimens and we perform extended uh, phenotypic TST, all drugs, so that we could uh, then uh, work out a salvage regimen, as well as um, do confirmation testing of resistance for both bedaquilin and lenizolid. And the reason being is that there's no commercial assay available 
and uh, standardization may be problematic. So everything that is picked up in the field as resistant is referred to the reference laboratory for further workup or confirmatory phenotypic testing. And should we fail or have any type of discordance, we then move on to next generation sequencing to try and support the routine service. The diagnostic capacity currently in the country, we have expert capacity to approximately 6.8 million uh, tests per annum, and we currently utilize 2.2 million of that. We have line pro assay capacity of about 400,000. Uh, our volumes in 2019 for first line, line probe assays was approximately 60,000, second line around 20,000. And then we also have extensive culture capacity where we have uh, we, we can actually, we have sufficient capacity for 1.3 million major tubes. Our use for TB culture is approximately 480,000 per annum. And for phenotypic testing, we do about 30,000 uh, per set. Uh, and, and these um, include uh, repeat tests and sometimes things that slip through that are not meant to be tested. So getting to this level was no easy task. Uh, the introduction of Badaculin came early and there was no uh, diagnostic companion. So uh, it became part of the national uh, policy framework that we do Badaculin surveillance, mainly to detect and analyze baseline resistance, detect and analyze the emergence of resistance on treatment, and detect potential cross resistance with other drugs such as clofazamine. And this has been published. So what happened is that anyone that was put onto a Badaculin regimen a baseline sputum was submitted to the reference laboratory for testing, and then at month two and month six again. So this was the approach we used and uh, the surveillance uh, we performed during this period of implementation. Further, we were, we were really involved in defining bedaculin resistance and, uh, and as well as the interpretive criteria for resistance, particularly phenotypic testing, and we've been involved in multi-country, multi-laboratory studies to try and support and establish the interpretive criteria, which was finally recommended as the tentative critical concentrations for bedaculin testing. So it was, we weren't only restricted to bedaculin, it, we also performed testing on linezolid as well as uh, levofloxacin. And also when we introduced the laminate in the country, it was only approved for uh, 200 patients, the clinical access program until licensing was completed, and we also performed surveillance on those as well and shared all our day, phenotypic data with the WHO to assist them in establishing the interpretive criteria. But what we've seen, what we currently seen in our laboratory based service, so South Africa is in a really advantaged position. Our lab, because we run a network of laboratories, we use a single lab information system, which is uh, uh, web-based. All the information then gets delivered into what we call the corporate data warehouse, where we can extract and have an idea of, this, of, of, of the uh, laboratory uh, confirmation of mycobacterium tuberculosis, as well as phenotypic testing. Uh, the graphs I'm showing you on the right is on the left is uh, confirmed TB. We've seen over the, from 2019 to 2022, which is up to quarter three. Of course, we see our COVID year really out of place. We've seen uh, test volumes drop by up to 50% across the country. And then of course, we've seen increases. Uh, what's interesting in our 2022 data, we currently exceeding our 2019 test levels by approximately 30%. So we're testing at about 130%, and this is part of our national TB recovery plan, where we aim to do an additional 1 million gene experts uh, in the country, uh, across the country as well. What we've seen on the right-hand side is basically um, our REF resistance TB, MDR, pre-XDR, and of course, so what I'm showing is uh, pre-XDR with fluoroquinolone and SLI. This was pre-WHO new definitions, and then uh, the 2021-2022, uh, 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 um, according to the new definitions. And, and what we're seeing is um, a, a, a huge, uh, we've seen a slight increase in fluoroquinolone resistance. And this is just three quarters. We're not sure where we'd end up this year. And also we're noticing XDR by definition, 
in, in both years and majority, I could say more than 95% are driven by bedaquilin and not linezolid. Linezolid is extremely rare uh, in terms of resistance. So that is our current program. And we're also now going to implement the expert XDR. And I just want to speak a bit about it and what's driving the decision for the implementation despite the current infrastructure we have available in country. So South Africa has participated in two multi-country studies evaluating the expert XDR. Uh, this was a laboratory evaluation which included South Africa and China. And then of course a field uh, evaluation response was fined. This has been published and um, available. So we were approached by the National TB program as the NHLS and requested with implementation of the XDR, basically to improve turnaround time, supporting the, the future introduction of the BPL, BPM, M regimens, which is uh, planned for early next year. Uh, the reason being is that the, the line probe assay on direct testing had a failure rate of approximately 33%. Our indirect testing sometimes yielded no results. And uh, once a specimen was had a contaminated culture or ended up being culture negative, no further processing occurred on that particular specimen. And we were then at, we were to wait for a new specimen. And just to give you an estimate on what the turnaround time for the line probe assay was in South Africa, or currently is, despite being a molecular assay that could be done within a day, the medium time to results was approximately 14 days, which ranged from five to 40 days. And, and the main reason driving this was cost containment. Uh, setting up one or two samples was not feasible for the laboratory because of the multiple controls that had to be run in parallel. So laboratories ended up batching and then your batching then dictated or uh, related to the turnaround time. And we're all aware the performance is of the expert XDR is equivalent to line probe assays. And the expectation in South Africa is that the XDR will improve the turnaround time based on what we see for the expert ultra. Currently, we have a turnaround time of more uh, for more than 90% of specimen within 40 hours. So this could make a huge impact in terms of providing results to the healthcare workers and assist them in supporting the regimen choice. So in March 2022, an important date and World TB month and day, the NHLS communicated implementation of the expert XDR to replace the line probe assays in South Africa. Of course, this was uh, the, the choice was made because of WHO endorsement and WHO currently endorses it, endorses it as a low complexity and South Africa is really familiar with expert testing. So what capacity do we have for the expert, for the expert XDR? Uh, this is a really, uh, we're really blessed. And um, because of the COVID pandemic, South Africa purchased uh, a, a huge, uh, a huge consignment of uh, gene expert instruments. Uh, the company weren't able to um, support the, the purchase volume and, and, and in, in to, to fulfill the order, they actually gave us 110 expert uh, ten, uh, gene expert 10 color instruments to 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 fulfill the order so that was a, a huge um, a, a huge thing for the country and and with the testing volumes really decreasing in the country we then uh, made a decision decision as the nhls to repurpose these instruments for tb testing to support the tr program currently we have capacity to perform 642000 test per annum and this is using an eight hour cycle and and this is more than sufficient because uh, from the earlier slides you would have noticed that we do approximately 60,000 line probe assays so uh, this uh, we have sufficient capacity internally well, when we decided on the implementation there were three approaches we thought of that uh, to, to fit into our national program and the first was to actually utilize the expert XDR and, and reflex directly from residual SL treated uh, ultra. Um, and this was to be done wherever MTB was detected. And this would have supported us picking up isoniazid resistance earlier on. And it would have been implementation across all sites uh, doing MTB testing. And um, that was the first option. The second option was the collection of a second sputum 
sputum for the expert XDR. And uh, we would only do that in cases where MTB was detected and rifampicin resistance. Uh, there would be no reflexin of residual samples. And uh, this would also be implemented across, across all expert testing sites. But uh, finally, we, we chose the strategy three approach. And basically, it's uh, the country is not ready, to, just coming out of COVID in terms of a financial perspective to support that type of volumes. Because on, on every, for South Africa, we do approximately 2.2 million experts per annum. And of those, about 250,000 are positive. So, so that was going to uh, result in huge expenditure, which we're not prepared for right now. So these strategies are not off the cards. Uh, we 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 were just uh, going to start off with a strategy three, and basically where we did the line probe assays, we will replace it with the expert test, and this would of course assist us uh, in the initial phases, as well as allow us to introduce the assay, as well as all the additional inf uh, uh, requirements for reporting and lab information system interfacing and and those type of things. So with the expert XDR, we now we would then of course have a revised DRTB reflex algorithm, and what you see boxed in red would now be replaced with the expert XDR cartridge. Of course, uh, it's going to be really um, reduce the workload and, and and burden within our laboratories across South Africa. So the implementation plan is uh, basically, as I mentioned, uh, to roll this uh, the expert assay out at the line probe assay sites. And that is the first phase. And then the second phase is uh, once successful, would then move to high volume expert ultra processing labs. And uh, this would this would accommodate approximately 80% of our test volumes across the country. This was just an implementation plan. And uh, this is our progress this far. And we, we plan to have the expert incorporated into our routine testing by the end of January. Uh, as I mentioned that we made an announcement in March 2022, and uh, we expect it to be completed with implementation at the end of this month. And what's happened is we were faced with several other challenges, which included uh, uh, where to deal uh, with um, two consumable shortages that supported our TB program. And there was the BD um, um, uh, consumable shortages as well as what we're currently experiencing now is the shortage of expert ultra test reagents. So despite having all the infrastructure and all these tests at our disposal, there's still, there's still multiple diagnostic challenges that we experience over the years. And, and I'm just going to list a few of them here. So because we were doing the expert ultra upfront, and then of course, trying to get our INH result of the line probe assay, we ended up with uh, discordance for of Ampersen. And, and this uh, really um, then uh, made clinicians weird, uh, what you call it, um, they weren't satisfied with this discordance we saw between the two molecular tests. And in the initial phases, we, we would then perform the resolution testing at the reference laboratory with repeat phenotypic TSD as well as to uh, sequencing to, to support the routine program. Then, of course, we know that the expert missed mutations, uh, these mutations fall outside the RRDR and selected low prevalence mutations as well. And, and what happens is we pick up uh, susceptible, uh, susceptible treatment uh, patients are not uh, uh, doing well on their treatment regimens. These samples were then referred at around month two to the reference laboratory for additional investigation. For well, a majority of them, we picked up to have the 491 mutation. Uh, the numbers are not massive, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't even account for two or three percent of all our TB detected in the country. Another issue we have is that once our primary diagnostic picks up of ampersand resistance, approximately 30 percent, and this varies across the country between uh, the different provinces, would have no follow-up sample received for additional testing. And we lose these patients, uh, they, they end up lost to follow-up in terms of diagnostic work. And um, this is concerning for us. Another issue we have is uh, phenotypic DST testing. Selected laboratories have high contamination rates, particularly at the phenotypic testing stage. As I mentioned, there's no commercial assays, so standardization is done primarily through SOPs. 
And then also confirmation of podaculin resistance as well as lenisolid, which is fairly rare. And, uh, be, and, and we actually seen a lot of discordance between routine and reference lab to, uh, uh, results. And uh, we, we then have to, again, resolve this by sequencing. And th this also uh, brings into mind something that was raised about the, re the, the, the resistance rate in betaquilin. So it is a very difficult thing to currently estimate because of the uh, substandard uh, phenotypic test and also the lack of standardization in terms of preparation. What we try to do in South Africa as the reference laboratory is all bedacquil and is prepared in-house at the reference and distributed across the DR reflex sites, uh, but we still see the discordance. And um, so the prevalence is really difficult to estimate currently. And then all these then end up in delayed turnaround times. And sometimes uh, patients are almost at the end of their treatment regimens when we're picking up resistance. So. Uh, we need some real uh, um, directed uh, focus on this on this aspect. Also, to mention again, supply chain issues faced. We face two major global shortages, uh, particularly immediate consumables, and this this had South Africa making decisions to drop specific drugs for phenotypic testing so that we could support the program uh, adequately. Uh, we managed to navigate through comfortably. And uh, we may have missed some things, but uh, we have to deal with it. And then, of course, now currently we're dealing with an expert ultra shortage. Uh, things are improving. We, we're managing to have reserve stocks currently. And I think the worst is over, but uh, we still will wait and see. And then the final issue we have in country is the introduction of new and repurposed drugs without a companion diagnostic. This was one of the most challenging things that we experience as a country. And um, it's something that needs to be addressed. And it's it's not only affecting South Africa, I think it's a, it has global impact. What's the future planning for South Africa? So we're currently evaluating uh, NGS solutions for the detection of drug resistance. So this is not restricted to targeted next-gen sequencing, which is the ideal, but also a whole genome sequencing uh, which also could reduce turnaround time significantly if we were able to utilize it in our settings. Um, and uh, what is critical, critically needed, of course, is an updated comprehensive catalog, as pointed out by Sophia, so that we could actually roll in and roll out uh, resistance. And something that we've learned as a country is we have to diversify our basket of routine diagnostics, so not to be reliant on a specific supplier. Should we have any issues, we would have something to fall back on. But we, had to, we have to consider additional parameters, not only about just having a basket of diagnostics. We need, get, we need to look at affordability, reporting standardization, because the end user has to be able to interpret what we present to them. And, and, and also because we have standardized regimen across the country and we are national laboratory, it is really important, important to standardize this. And of course, what's happened in South Africa is that uh, laboratory staff have become spoiled in terms of um, the, 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 the lab processing for expert. And the newer, the low, the moderate and high complexity um, technologies endorsed by the WHO uh, would, be, would not be welcomed easily and would also, would also require us to have sufficient training and upskilling of staff to move over to these new technologies. Thank you for your attention and we'll take questions. Okay, Dr. Slatik, Dr. Margarit. Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Omar. I see just one question from Tiam uh, on bedaculin being a new drug which is currently being used and, you know, with the evolving resistance, what are the measures in terms of MNE? 
to guide low income settings against this alarming evidence uh omar you'd like to answer that yes so basically what we we, we actually do in the country is uh, we've established two surveillance sites where we're actually uh evaluating the use of next gen sequencing for this particular purpose what we're finding is that there's a there's there's a huge discordance in terms of phenotypic testing and 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 next gen sequencing where we we've seen this uh, this gray area where resistance is currently predicted and and uh, pheno and genotypic evidence is not supporting the resistance and repeat testing of course working out is susceptible so i think before we could even have an mne we need to actually uh, have a diagnostic that is accurate and robust to actually predict resistance, because currently what we're doing is all based on um, in-house preparations. So that is currently a problem we face, but at least it gives you a, an estimate of what your resistance is. And as a low-income country, the only option currently that we could recommend is uh, the use of phenotypic DST um, uh, to, to actually uh, try and support some type of monitoring and evaluation as it is the most um, uh, and, uh, most, um, uh, what you call it, evaluated in terms of uh, betaquiline. There is a lot of work being done in terms of resistance prediction from uh, sequencing, and I think a WHO updated mutation catalog would have more information. But like uh, we say, there's not always, um, not every mutation in those regions we, we, we uh, target uh, are associated with resistance. I hope that answers your question. Okay. So I um, see a sec second question from Shamshuddin. So I, how do you deal with laboratory accreditation exercises and effort to address discordance in diagnosis and staff quality? So what we do is as the reference, we run an, in, an external and uh, in, in, um, EQA, we send out a panel of uh, known resistant and known susceptible strains across the testing laboratories. And uh, what we what's happened in the last year, one of the laboratories didn't perform well, so we actually stopped testing at that site and all samples were then referred to the reference laboratory for, for testing. So we run this program uh, annually and uh, to try and ensure that um, the required standards are met for testing. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid. And I think uh, we do have time for brief discussion now. So everyone's heard from a variety of speakers regarding burning issues related to two topics. The first is a GDI topic implementing the drug resistant TB WHO policies and challenging scenarios. And the second GLI topic looking at enablers to scale up the use of new tools for TB diagnostic in complex emergency situations. I want to stress that it's not too late to post any thoughts, comments, or queries in the chat. Uh, that would help lead this discussion, so please feel free to. Um, maybe I can start with a question for my colleague, Dr. Monadero. You underscored that one of the biggest issues with drug-resistant TB management during complex emergencies is the lack of treatment or inappropriate treatment. Though it seems that we have this lack of data for drug resistant TB rates or transmission during times of conflict. However, we do have some historical data to su suggest how treatment availability really impacts drug resistant TB profiles. One of the examples that comes to my mind is the overuse of second line injectables, especially canamycin, in the Eastern European region before this fall of the Soviet Union which really selected for this high prevalence we see of SLI resistant strains there. In thinking of ways to combat this, do you think that countries with a risk for resistance selection as an over reliance on available drugs in complex emergencies should have priority access to relevant drug resistant TB diagnostic technologies such as expert XDR? Well, um, absolutely, right? The, the point is that uh, during the poll, we were making these questions, right, about, okay, there are plenty of challenges there, 
there are risk of resistance there, but the price of doing nothing can be even worse, right? So neither there is no win-win solution, not at all. The point is that if we do nothing, people is going to continue searching for care and they are going to get for a win loans, they are going to get injectables, whatever it is, but transmission continue there. And also the good point is that with little support of the NTPs, we saw exactly the same with the Damian Foundation presentation. And also with all these countries from Middle East supported by, by WHO, by, by IOM, MSF, Red Cross, different programs are performing really well. So again, to me, then the mismatching or the, the puzzle here with this, with this symposium is that we, we are seeing like completely different worlds. One, one is the, the challenging scenarios, the other is the, the novelties. How can we bring them together? This is the, the million dollar question. Apologies, I don't know if we we lost we lost him there. Uh, maybe we should move on with another another question. So I I also have a, doc, a question for Dr. Roji. So the strict monitoring of patients has simplified the transition to all oral treatment. What is the key to maintaining high levels of favorable outcomes with these new all oral TB treatment regimens? Thank you so much, Sophia. Yes, uh, indeed, this is a, a very important point because uh, uh, with the oral, oral regimen, we have to be sure that uh, we are we didn't start treatment with uh, the presence of resistance of chloroquinone, for example, and also bedaquiline. Yes, uh, we have to um, to have two kind of approach, two parallel approach. The first is a clinical approach. So we have to monitor uh, very strictly the patient every month in order to understand if there is some adverse events related to the drugs. And, and also if this kind of, if the regimen that we want to use uh, uh, works well. And at the same time, we, we need to improve it, to have a good laboratory result, the laboratory network is, is a crucial point. So uh, in order to um, stop if we need it, the regimen and uh, in order to choice a good treatment, also an individual treatment if we need it. So for me, we have to invest, as I said, we have to invest in a laboratory network in order to know the profile of resistance or sensitivity of uh, the patient before uh, start the treatment is essential. Yeah. And uh, this is also related to the another question. So, so if we should, in, in, should countries in complex emergencies have priority access to drug resistant TB diagnosis technology implementation? My opinion is yes, we need, uh, because it's the, the most important uh, point in order to avoid a, a disaster. So in order to improve uh, um, resistance to fluoroquinolone, the daclin and new drugs also. Thank you. Thank you, very good point. Uh, there's also a question in the chat I see. Most molecular technologies in the pipeline, and this is, it's true, it includes the new SD biosensor M10 
and BioNear Existation continue to focus on the first line drugs, isoniazide and rifampicin resistance detection. So how do we spur the development of technologies for expanded resistance detection and accelerate the timelines for deployment of these? And it's, it's a difficult question, right? Because the I think the very first thing is knowing what targets, what molecular targets to go after. And that is something where I think the WHO mutations catalog has been a huge step in the right direction. The problem is that that catalog is still so dependent on the global community coming together, sharing data. Um, we, we need to make sure that these technologies are designed to be suitable for all tech for all settings where they're really needed. So the first thing would be to, you know, to contribute to that catalog. You know, there's going to be forthcoming iterations of that catalog. And that's something that developers as well are going to be looking at to see what molecular targets they need to start including in their assay. But also kind of lowering, lowering the barrier for development, keep making the marker very competitive. You know, there's a lot of drugs where we have no molecular diagnostics available. So that that should be good incentive for developers to move forward with development. But at the same time, you know, they need something to go off of, knowing how to design their assays. And I, I do think the global community needs to come together to kind of help accelerate that. And in terms of the, the timeline for deployment, it's another huge challenge. You know, a lot of these drugs have been in use for quite some time now, and we're still not seeing rapid molecular assays. So there, one, of, one opportunity, I think, although the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed a lot of the progress we've made as a global community in the fight against TB, at the same time, we can kind of harness that momentum for development of new technologies and using those COVID-19 innovations now for tuberculosis. I mean, with COVID-19, you know, we've seen kind of the power of using scientific muscle to combat a pandemic. And I think we can learn a lot of, from that for TB and especially in terms of molecular assay development. So thank you for the question. Another question, um, let's see. Anything else in the chat anyone would like to ask? Please go ahead. Uh, this is me. Sorry, I have, I don't know why, unstable connection. So what we really love to have in tuberculosis is something similar than, than in HIV field. I know the complexities in tuberculosis are wide beyond from, from HIV because it's a virus. There are much more genes involved. But how close are we really to, to have something similar to this kind of platforms uh, for phenotypic, sorry, for virtual phenotypes that, that we can finally work like the same we are working with resistance with HIV. Are we really close to that or, or we are not yet there? Because it, it's, it would be really fantastic. Over. Is that a question for me? Ignacio? <laughs> uh, for, for you or for anyone <laughs> from the audience, from the GLI audience or from the laboratory? Yes, and we saw from Dr. Roji's talk that a high proportion of deaths were observed in patients with the TBHIV infection. So also, you know, those diseases that detect disease across uh, different disease on the same platform would be incredibly beneficial there. But maybe Dr. Roji, you can speak to that and how that outcome can be improved for those patients and settings as well. Thank you so much. Exactly. This is a good point because uh, if we talk in terms of clinical management of patients, the fact that we have a, how we can say, two vertical approach on, on HIV, on TB and other diseases, uh, it's it's a very it's 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 um, it's very complicated to manage clinic manage the patient. So if we can have a a, a one point <laughs> where we can manage all the all two uh, diseases, could be uh, a good opportunity to improve our outcome. But at the moment, in in the context that I know, it's very 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 difficult 
we send the patient to one uh, well, to one health facilities to another one, and uh, often not in the same village or in the same uh, in the same uh, provinces. So, so you can imagine that uh, how this kind of situation can uh, create uh, can complicate the the, the management of, uh, of TB patient. This is my experience, but uh, probably in, in other in other contexts, it's, uh, the situation is uh, is better. But um, in low um, uh, in the in the in country where we, where we have problems to 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 carry out TB activities, this could, could be a very a big problem. Well, in, in reality, my, my question was um, more directed to, to the laboratory people here. Um, I was asking if, if we are getting any close to, to virtual phenotypes, right, based on, on genes, right, and, and getting this kind of information. For example, the, the National Health or the former National Health Institute in, in England is considering going for whole genome sequencing for everyone. So I don't know if this kind of libraries of, of mutations and resistance and comparing mutations and resistance profile in the patient, are, are we getting close to, to this kind of platforms that we already have for HIV resistance? Well, we are not yet there. Probably we need to wait for one decade or something more. Oh, well, thank you. Sophia, if I may. Yeah, you're on mute. Okay, Ignacio. Uh, I think in terms of the um, diagnostic um, accuracy or sensitivity for the TB drugs, I think we're making huge strides. First line, second line, I think we're getting in the upper 90% sensitivity to, compared to current diagnostics. Lenizolid is obviously an easy picking. Sophia pointed it out in her talk. It, it's really restricted to two sites. And, um, and, and pedaculin problematic, but uh, we've, uh, there's sufficient data coming through right now. And I think um, the updated catalog would have more, inf more useful information, particularly for pedaculin. But the data is really skewed because uh, South Africa was always an early implementer of, of, of new drugs and new technologies. And generally the data comes out of a, 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 a single country. And, and uh, like Sophia points out as well, is that we need to expand and all countries that have the capacity for COVID should now apply it for TB. So we could have a, 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 a holistic view of what's happening across the globe. And, and, and that's not coming through right now. So I think in terms of the, 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 the older drugs, there, there is um, a lot of, um, I would say fairly sensitive, but the newer drugs then uh, should, uh, that, I mean, we're coming out with predominant and I don't think we've, we've seen resistance or we have actually got a hit on what is the target associated with resistance. And I mean, we're introducing BPL regimens and, 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 and then again, we're going to start generating data with, in, in South Africa again. Uh, hopefully, if it's uh, more controlled and, and, uh, and uh, I think with the cryptic consortium, we try to do something like that. We try to get representation across uh, all continents, but um, uh, not everyone had the same regimens in use at the time. So what we've seen in South Africa wouldn't be seen in, in other countries across the world. So I think uh, it's moving, the momentum is still there, and, um, but uh, <laughs> we got, we, we're struggling with other issues in the TB field rather than, um, and, and where do we prioritize? I mean, loss to follow up, uh, finding missing cases, introduction of uh, what TPT, so, I mean, we, we just, we need to try and get some focus and, and, and assist. Because of course, if MDR um, spreads, uh, drug resistance um, spreads, I mean, it's going to impact on uh, control efforts. So um, it, it has to be prioritized and put right up. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes, and you know, and a precursor almost, and one thing that really struck me from your talk, Dr. Omar, is also the great increase in diagnostic capacity in Southern Africa is incredibly impressive. And that that is one thing, you know, as as well, you know, we need to make sure those remote regions are connected as well and can contribute to this effort to make sure these diagnostics are really fit for purpose. I see Dr. Marguerite, your hand is up. 
Yes, thank you. No, I just wanted maybe to add on what uh, was just said also, maybe from a wider perspective. So, because indeed we've seen for the WHO catalog, this was mostly informed by big research consortia, uh, but not systematic gathering of data at the national level. But I would come back to the point you were making about the need to leverage really on, on innovation in the COVID-19 uh, as fair and what has been done for diagnostics, but not only we've seen, for example, in Africa, the, the huge raise in, in building uh, capacity at country level for sequencing, right? And so the window is there, we need to seize it and really, as South Africa has done, uh, re by repurposing the gene expert, also, you know, repurposing, using that capacity for sequencing now, uh, and to use it for TB as well, and to be able to generate uh, uh, systematic data coming from a variety of countries, a variety of settings, to really build that evidence base, which is needed also. Thank you. Okay, any more questions, comments? If not, I, I have a question. Also, also to you, Sophia, um, uh, on the comments, right on the chat in this in this conference call, um, you you put that um, in some settings the um, retomanid resistance among drug resistant TB patients was nearly twenty percent. Uh, it, it was to me something extraordinarily shocking. I was really surprised because uh, we have a big problem of rising resistance from bedaculin and this retomanid twenty percent. I would like to, to know if this is um, really something on a specific population, if this is from a survey, if this is published data, because as you know, according to the rapid communication from the WHO, many countries are going to change into the BPAL, BPAL M regimen in, in, the, in the next few years. So this can be the next standard. Well, if this figure is something that we can generalize to other population, this means really problems ahead. If this is something very punctual on our population, okay. Right? So if you can clarify a little bit of this, I, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, whenever we see these numbers, they are incredibly concerning. But one thing to point out and from your talk as well is that it's a lot of these are from particular regions, geographical contexts. We don't really have this broad prevalence or surveillance data yet for these new drugs, which is problematic. I mean, that again is one of the first steps you need to really say the extent of this. And the other piece of that picture is also not, not so much the prevalence of resistance, but what does this mean? You know, it's, are these patients more likely to fail on these regimens? Or is there some benefit, as we know, bedaculin um, it, in regimens with pyrazinamide, you know, there's a synergistic effect that can happen. So it could overcome some baseline mutations and resistance rates that we're seeing. And we're really, we're really missing that data yet. But we do know that resistance is there. It's not very easy to say the extent of it globally or in particular settings, but I do think this is something that we should not take lightly and we should be concerned about. And we should also look twice at this when making decisions on what treatment decisions should be made, especially in different settings. But the key part is that data generation right now, you know, we need to scale this up, including in more remote regions, regions we don't have the data yet. So not a very satisfying satisfying answer, I'm sorry, but but definitely an opportunity to really kind of grow this field and reveal what's going on. Yes, because the, the point is that we know that the daculin probably have a primary resistance level, uh, which is higher than expected. But if something happens like that as well with pletomanid, that is also uh, an important issue. Well, in Definitely. fact, these two, these new two drugs, they, they are really fantastic. They are performing really well. But we can be facing something similar to, to some of HIV uh, antiretrovirals, right? That they are presenting what is called an HIV low genetic barrier, meaning that they can easily develop resistance quickly. Well, for example, other drugs are apparently much more robust, like, like linesolid. So again, this can be a, a critical issue on the BPAL uh, implementation or the BPAL implementation. Over. 
Very true. And I also see there was a, a question in the chat I had missed about would would industry have the same appetite for developing TB diagnostics as they did for COVID due to the population it affects, generally low middle income countries? So that that is a challenge, is it both a challenge and an opportunity, I think. The thing here is that we have a lot of new existing technologies for COVID that could be at, at, adapted for TB. You know, TB is also a respiratory pathogen. There's a similar airborne transmission pathway. And so we're seeing a lot of these innovations, you know, can easily be adapted without a lot of that upfront development work that costs developers so much time and money. And I think that's the opportunity there. So I wouldn't necessarily say, unfortunately, the appetite may not be the same, but it's not a big jump. You know, this is something where we can step in, we can start to push manufacturers, especially for those non-sputum-based solutions to really expand testing to more vulnerable populations. So we, we can finally, you know, start to get to diagnosis of children, people living with HIV, populations that are missed by a lot of our sputum-based tests. So it's, you know, it's on us to kind of push it in that direction. And we, we are working towards that. Um, but we, you know, the mark is there. They may, it's, it may be a more disadvantaged group than, you know, COVID we're talking about a pandemic that impacts the entire world, but here, you know, the, the jump should not be that hard. And now is the time to kind of use that momentum to push the development of these non-sputum based assays. I, I wonder if WHO can can push. Uh, I don't know when shifting the market is complicated, but probably some kind of high level um, conversation, right? Not, not not as technical people that we are, but high high on the top, right? If this kind of conversations really occur, that would be really fantastic. Getting license for for testing all this technology into the into tuberculosis, right? Yeah. You know, unfortunately, one, I think one step there that will also be a challenge is that a lot of these non-sputum based assays, so whether we're talking about aerosol based detection, uh, tongue swabs are a very popular pursuit right now, whether they can be developed for resistance, whether sensitivity will be sufficient to make that that's crossover to drug resistance detection for these sample types where you may not have as many bacilli within the sample. So that there's still some unknown questions there, but of course the first step is getting testing to everyone who needs a test. And these, these non-sputum based tests can help start getting us there. See, there's a question from Charlie, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to uh, join in here or um, just to say that from the WHO side. So of course we welcome any types of tests that, that would be easier to sample and, and to use. Uh, though it's always the problem of, I mean, recommendations from WHO side must be based on evidence. So, so WHO can't recommend things that are new and look really good uh, until there is actually evidence showing that they work and that they are cost efficient and that uh, they can be that uh, users uh, um, accept them and that uh, that they have the the um, performance that that is needed. So. So, I mean, WHO is very, very dependent on the research community and on countries and on programs producing results in, in operational research uh, that then can be evaluated uh, from, from, from our, by us and, and uh, recommendations if, if uh, they perform and, and are suitable. Thanks. Thank you, very clear and good point, yes. No, and a lot, a lot of these COVID innovations too, you know, only they come to the table only with data with COVID. And so we know COVID and TB are very, very different beasts. So it's, there is still some development work to do, but at least, you know, there's some, there's technology readily available that we can start harnessing. So well, apparently, and um, technology is helping and is helping a lot, but probably we cannot rely only on that, right? So mm -hmm. I want to come back the issue to the complex emergencies again. So this is kind of um, traditional public health approaches, trying to understand 
the situation, doing situation analysis, checking what we have there. So again, probably the, the classic approaches are still needing, of course, well, new technology. And, and I think the expert XDR can really make a difference in, in many of these sites, especially if we have another threat with fluoroquinone resistance. But again, probably it, this um, pretomanid resistance and quick beraculin resistance increase, right? Raise the, the issue that, that probably regimens are going to be needing to, to, to evolve and, and probably come back into something solid, uh, whether there is technology to back up DST or, or not. But certainly, the point is how to approach in the most underserved situations how to, to do quality medicine and, and using proper phenotypic or especially genotypic tests, right? So again, more or less, we are in the, in the same situation, but well, if I look back 10, 20 years back, I, I think we have achieved in one decade, it really, really a revolutionary road, right? We, we have changed many things. So I really hope in, in the next year, something like that happens as well. Definitely, I thank you. I think that's a good note to pass it over on. So thank you for the discussion. I don't know if someone has any kind of burning question, final question, because we are approaching to the end of this symposium. So, okay, okay I can okay. see. Yeah, indeed, there is no burning question coming in the chat box. So, yes, it seems that we have reached now the end of uh, this uh, joint GLI GDI uh, uh, workshop, uh, really, and, and based on the various uh, challenges and the, the damaging effect of the COVID-19 pandemic that all of you have uh, mentioned, really, uh, I think we've had like a very excellent uh, presentation by all the speakers that I would like uh, to acknowledge, really, and uh, trying to really define the priorities uh, for the recovery effort and really uh, trying uh, to climb back uh, the, 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 the steep uh, curve uh, to go back to the level uh, that we have lost now uh, because of the pandemic towards reaching uh, the, the, the targets of the NTB uh, strategy. And maybe if I can just uh, go back and do a quick recap of the various presentation which have been made, I think that uh, Ignacio uh, in this uh, presentation really uh, highlighted the specific challenges uh, that are met in, in those countries which are facing either conflicts or, or uh, emergencies and the disruption to the various TB services, uh, be it for um, uh, human resources, uh, the, the diagnostic uh, services, uh, the treatment capacity, as well as the supply chain, all those uh, that need to be addressed. And um, uh, but while at the same time, so while explaining that there is a spectrum of situation, depending on the countries, not all of them uh, may be as affected. Uh, you can go for from no uh, national TV program to intermediate situation where you have fragmented services, but still the need to really provide support. And he has indicated with the example of Iraq, for example, that where uh, the situational analysis is done, uh, the problem is well identified and coordination is in place, support is provided. Um, there still is a possibility to have a good performance. And I think uh, through the presentation of Alberto as well, so uh, focusing on two countries which are also in complex um, situations, so uh, Guinea-Conakry as well as Niger, we've seen that it, it is still possible to have a good performance and to have uh, favorable outcomes. And, and this um, uh, with also the use of shorter regimen and ideally even uh, injectables free regimen. But not only that, but also the support provided to the patient, uh, really for uh, the nutritional support, uh, support for transportation, et cetera. This really um, helps to have a good performance. And also one specific contribution, I think, which has been highlighted is the one of specimen transport system and really uh, aiming to which is allowing to have shorter delays to treatment initiation. So the link between the diagnostics and also uh, treatment initiation is key. 
Uh, and then through uh, Sophia's uh, uh, presentation, really on the diagnostic gaps. So uh, we've seen that the issue there is really that the tools are not fit for purpose. And especially in low resource uh, setting, there is that need as the entry point is the lower tier of, of the healthcare pyramid. So the community or the primary healthcare level that need to have uh, sputum uh, free um, diagnostic test, rapid diagnostic test, but while at the same time uh, keeping in mind that those low complexity assay, rapid assay, oftentimes do not provide a wide enough coverage for a detection of, of resistance. And so that need also at the same time to build capacity for um, expanded resistance testing, detection, and especially to safeguard those new and repurpose drugs that we have now, like bedaquiline, linezolid. So we've seen the need really uh, to be able, uh, because we've talked about uh, primary resistance, secondary resistance, which is has been reported. So the need to be able to detect those and, and the contribution uh, of sequencing for providing more uh, understanding of the resistance mechanism and also to inform the development of rap rapid diagnostics uh, drug resistance assay on the one end, and also maybe that, that, that possibility to use targeted uh, next generation sequencing and, and uh, um, for uh, rapid uh, detection of resistance. And, and we have uh, closed with the, the presentation also from Saeed really highlighting the example of South Africa, which I always say South Africa is a trailblazer for TB uh, on the African continent, but really uh, which has he has um, demonstrated really uh, the, the evidence base and also the need to be pragmatic and to have um, um, a lower complexity, more robust uh, and context relevant assay uh, for detection of resistance and the choice that the country made informed choice to go and deploy the, the uh, XDR uh, expert cartridge. Uh, widely in the country, and also building on the innovation, or in that case, the capacity that COVID-19 brought, and, and so the expanded network of, of gene expert uh, equipment in the country. And so that that really, that uh, decision to, to leverage on, on COVID-19 assets uh, is, is also a lesson learned. And um, I would like to close on the word of Said actually, um, that need to reach a good balance and, and to ensure that introduction of new drug should also be coupled to introduction of companion, uh, robust, fit for purposes, uh, diagnostic assay that could allow us also to predict resistance. And so that the push that we have just um, um, uh, addressed now during the discussion uh, to, for the development of, of more diagnostic solution to diversify the toolbox of uh, available diagnostic assay, to be available at country level. And finally, also uh, the call to grow capacity to generate more data uh, on resistance that sh should be uh, also widely uh, representative of various geographical contexts um, uh, and country, um, et cetera. So uh, I think I will stop here, but before stopping, once again, um, I think uh, we need to acknowledge the excellent presentation from our, our, our four speakers. And also I wish to acknowledge uh, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Sarabjit. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank the TB Union really for organizing this workshop and all of you participants for uh, taking uh, part in, 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 in the discussion through your questions. And I think I will hand over to the moderator or maybe Sarabjit, if you would like to add a, a, a last a word as I'm ending over. To, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And I'll just echo what you just said. You know, it was a very, very productive discussion and excellent uh, presentations by all speakers. And, and I think the recommendations which have, the recommendations and experience which the speakers presented is something which needs to be replicated across all uh, resource-constrained high-burden countries uh, so that, you know, we are able to gain ground on what we've lost uh, due to COVID and also, you know, to increase uh, the drug sensitivity testing uh, and diagnose more drug resistant TB cases uh, and, uh, you know, work towards our goal of eliminating TB by 2030. 
So thank you, everyone. And it was a pleasure to have you all uh, in this uh, course workshop. Uh, over to you, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's workshop. Thank you for all the speakers uh, also in the chairs of this workshop. I just want to remind participants that when this Zoom meeting closes, you will see a survey appear in your browser. We would appreciate if you could complete it so uh, we could have feedback. Also, um, um, you will uh, be receiving a link of the recording of this session today within the next couple of days. Um, on behalf of the union and all the presenters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.